Just a few announcements and reminders before we get started today. Um, we are meeting at the Central Wyoming College, and they do have a mask mandate that's in effect when, while we're indoors. And so um, we're taking our masks off um, so you can hear us on the mics. We feel like it's a little too muffled. Um, but as we're out and about in the hallways, certainly please keep your masks on. And then um, attendees, please sign in on the sign-in sheet. And um, if folks get hungry, there's a wonderful cafeteria on campus, so please feel free to visit that. Um, we'll do the roll call. Excuse me, Senator Case? Excused. Senator Salazar? Representative Blackburn? Representative Clifford? Excused. Chairman Ellis? Present. Chairman Larson? Here. Okay. Looks like we have a quorum. Um, we're a little, uh, we do things a little different at tribal relations. One really nice um, custom we have is for everyone in the room to introduce themselves. So we'll just go around really quickly and then um, have the people in the room introduce themselves. So we'll start here to my right. Uh, Jim Blackburn, House District. 42 in Cheyenne. Affie Ellis, Senate District 8 in Cheyenne. I'm uh, Lloyd Larson. I live in Lander, representing House District 54. Heather Hunter, LSO staff. Donna Shippen, LSO staff. Heather Jarvis, LSO staff. All righty, welcome everyone. The first item on our agenda today is um, Indian Education Act for all Wyoming updates in comparison with the My a Montana experience. So I'd welcome Kari and Rob up to the, and Terry, um, if you'd like, up to the table. And please introduce yourself for the record. Well, good morning, I'm Kari Akins. I'm the Chief Policy Officer at the Wyoming Department of Education. I'm Rob Black. Wyoming Department of Education, Social Studies Consultant and Native American Liaison. So we did provide a memo for the select committee today and I will go ahead and do a quick walk through that memo and then we'll be available to answer any questions the select committee may have. So as everybody gets to that memo, I'll just start off with um, the background of what we're talking about today. And um, it is known as Indian Education for All in Wyoming. Specifically, it was a piece of legislation that passed in 2017 that was titled American Indian Education Program. That was House Enrolled Act uh, 119 in 2017. And uh, there were several requirements in this piece of legislation. Uh, the big one was for Wyoming to review its social studies standards in order to ensure that the culture, history, and contemporary contributions of American Indians are addressed. Um, there were some specific references to both the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho tribe, as they, of course, are the two tribes that reside in Wyoming. And then also um, requirements for the Wyoming Department of Education to make resources and materials available on its website. So after this bill passed in 2017 and was signed into law, the Wyoming Department of Education worked with the state board in order to um, convene a committee to review the standards going through our normal processes for standards review. So there were 25 individuals uh, that were convened in order to take a look at the social studies standards and see if any revisions or additions were necessary in order to meet the requirements of the law. Indeed, there were. And uh, that process went through um, several stages of public comment. And then uh, finally the promulgation process for um, 
chapter 10 administrative rules, which is where the content and performance standards live for the Wyoming Department of Education. That's where all of our statewide standards are, is in our chapter 10 rules. So those um, rules with the uh, revisions for Indian Ed for All were signed into effect by the governor on August 15th of 2018. Per state statute, when there is a revision to standards, school districts are given three school years in order to implement those standards into their curriculum and their district assessment system. So they basically have three years um, to uh, figure out what they want their curriculum to be to teach those standards and then begin teaching those standards. That means that this school year, this fall of 2021, was the first year in which it is required for all school districts in the state to be teaching the standards that were revised because of the Indian Edge for All um, Act in Wyoming. So, I do wanna note that uh, this summer, there was a report published by Fordham that did give a very low grade to our social studies standards uh, in regards to civics and US history. However, a strength of those standards was the specific areas in which those standards had been revised for Indian Ed for All. Um, you can see in the memo specifically, it was noted that the content on Wyoming's indigenous tribes is clearly presented and that the portions on the standards of tribal government are reasonably clear and specific. Um, it should also be noted that the rest of the social studies standards in Wyoming have not been um, reviewed since 2014. There was a legislative change in 2015 um, that put the standards review on a nine year timeline and required additional public comment. So that timeline is, re is um, reviewed and approved by our state board. And because the social studies standards were the last ones changed in 2014, they are at the end of that nine year schedule. So 2023 is when those social studies standards are scheduled to be reviewed again. Um, so as we look at um, the implementation of those revised social studies standards. Of course, there um, is the requirement for the department to provide resources and materials to assist school districts in implementing Indian Ed for All on the Wyoming Department of Education website. And um, we did hold several workshops over the past several years. In fact, the last time I was in Fremont County was for one of these social studies workshops in January of 2020. Uh, and we've also worked with several partners um, that have helped to ensure that there are resources that were developed thoughtfully and with the cooperation of both the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho tribes. Um, so we do have um, on our website where those resources are available. And then um, also, I mean, one of the wonderful partners is here today to present Wyoming PBS, but I should also mention Wyoming Humanities, Wyoming State Historical Society, the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, and there are many others who have um, stepped up to make sure that there are resources and materials available for school districts in order to have um, good curriculum, curricular resources for them to choose for as they implement these standards. Um, a couple of, one exciting thing um, that we are currently still working on is, uh, a project which we, is made possible through a grant with the Amer um, that we got with the American Institute for Research for, through the National Science Foundation. It's nearly a million dollars to partner with both tribes on the Wind River Indian Reservation and uh, develop lesson plans that actually um, are, they implement computer science changes and the Indian Ed for all changes at the same time. So the lessons, um, it, uh, they, they, I'm trying to not use cross-curricular and educational words right now, but I can't think of the simple terms, but they embed them together so that the Indian Ed for All standards and the computer science are able to be implemented um, for grades four and three through five. Three through five. Um, so that there are options there. And so we are in year three of that project. Um, we've had students contribute um, artwork and um, some really interesting pieces uh, for the for the programs that they'll be using on the computer science side. And so at the same time they're learning computer science, they will also be learning about uh, the culture uh, and contemporary contributions of Native American people in Wyoming. Uh, so we are on year five of that, or year three of that five-year project right now, um, and very excited to have lesson plans, uh, additional lesson plans be able to roll out shortly. Um, Lastly, this final section of the memo does talk about Indian education for all in Montana. And uh, Montana is basically where uh, this initiative started. They were the first ones to uh, make changes, uh, legal changes and add requirements for schools specific in this area. And so there's a bullet list of um, kind of the main tenets of what Indian Ed for All looks like in Montana. 
um, on that first bullet, you'll see it noted that they did actually amend their state constitution in 1972. Uh, it, the state recognizes the distinct and unique cultural heritage of American Indians and is committed in its educational goal to the preservation of their cultural integrity. Then in 1999 is when Montana mandated teaching of the heritage of American Indians. Also in 1999, there was added a requirement um, that the school, the state and the local schools work specifically with Montana tribes to develop a, appropriate curricular materials. And also in 1999, uh, was they added a requirement for all public school personnel to have knowledge about the American Indian tribes and cultures in Montana. And then finally in 2007, there was another big change in which they dedicated annual funding for implementation of Indian Ed for All to, at the rate of $22 per pupil per year. Um, and so I just did wanna note that uh, while both in Wyoming and Montana, it is called Indian Ed for All, there are some differences in those initiatives in both states. So the Biggest changes, of course, is that Wyoming's Indian Ed for All does not did not include a constitutional amendment. It also does not have the requirement for all public school personnel to have knowledge of American Indian tribes and cultures, and it also does not have the dedicated annual funding. Um, school districts are expected to use funds out of their block grant for curricular materials in order to obtain curricular materials relative to Indian Ed for All. There was no change in their funding um, with our Indian Ed for All bill. And then finally, I'll just note that um, in July 2021, there was a lawsuit filed against the Montana Office of Public Instruction and the Board of Public Education um, that was filed by the ACLU of Montana and the Native American Rights Fund, and uh, basically saying that the state did not meet their legal and constitutional obligations relevant to Indian Ed for All in Montana. Um, and it relies heavily on a uh, recommendations that were made in a 2015 evaluation of implementation of Indian Ed for All in Montana. So. I realized that that was a lot of details thrown very quickly at this select committee, um, but Rob and I are available to answer any questions. Co-chairman Larson. Thanks, uh, Mrs. Aikens. I, I guess what I've never, I've been a little uncertain of, and even though this bill originated here in this committee and we brought it forth, in the bill as you read it through, it, it requires us to, uh, encompass or uh, include the uh, an emphasis on on the uh, the two tribes here in our social study standard, and you've done that. But then, is it a requirement in the social study standard in all school districts that there will be an um, an emphasis to teach? Indian education in their social studies, or is it just an option? Ms. Aikens. Yep. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Chairman. Um, so while there is an emphasis on the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho tribes, there is also a late amendment to the Wyoming Indian Ed for All bill, which also mentioned tribes of the region. So I believe that was more specific to, um, you, you know, if the Sheridan area wanted to focus more on the Crow people. Uh, and so it does add a little bit more flexibility at the local level for school districts to choose um, if they want to emphasize uh, certain tribes over others. However, the standards were done with that focus on the Northern Arapaho and Eastern Shoshone people. Follow up. Yeah. And I guess what I'm trying to get through my head, Kari, is all, all school districts in the state are required. It's not an option to teach engine education for all in their social studies, it's a requirement. Ms. Akins. Ms. Chairman, uh, Representative Larson, that is correct. It is, it is a requirement as of this fall. Right, and then on those schools, Madam Chairman, uh, on the schools that have um, started that earlier, are you catching any feedback on how that's going, how it's received? Um, we, we talked a little bit about the uh, mod, uh, models that are out there for them to use. Uh, is, is that adequate? Do they like what's been provided? Can you give us a flavor of how that's going? Ms. Akins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Representative Larson. So of course the early adopters were all um, enthusiastic adopters as well. And so there's been very positive feedback for those early adopters. Um, to be seen because it's still very early in this school year about how that implementation is going in other school districts across the state. 
Um, we have seen that, uh, as I mentioned, there are some partners that <laughs> developed some fabulous resources. You're going to see an example of that um, when Wyoming PBS um, follows us at this table. And I'm frankly glad that we don't have to go after them because <laughs> they have fabulous resources that they've made available. And we are continuing to work on adding more resources. Um, to this point, the focus, uh, the materials that have been made available do seem to focus on grade four and up. And so um, we are looking for opportunities to add in more resources in those lower grades. Um, and we see this as a continual process because um, history will continue to be made as the years pass. And so uh, we, our intention as a department is to continue to look for options and resources in order to continue to add to the materials that are available, um, that it, it not just be you know, we met this requirement because there's a list of resources available. So um, our, our days before this select committee um, in this area have been spent meeting with schools um, in order to look for ways to add more resources. Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I have a question. So I just want to reiterate the fact that prior, before this bill was passed, mm -hmm. I mean, is it safe to say that um, Wyoming schools out there throughout the state, they were they were teaching somewhat Native American history, particularly my experience with my kids and particularly myself going through the, the education system growing up, particularly around Thanksgiving. But I mean, it's, it, so is it safe to say that schools around Wyoming have taught somewhat Native American history, but yet again, like we're, we're talking about, just, just kind of just raised the standard with adding material and then having tribes and consultation, you know, people doing it, teaching it better. Um, so is that safe to say that, I mean, it's not like nobody, no school district in the state of Wyoming never taught any Native American history um, ever. Is that safe to say? Ms. Akins, Ms. Chairwoman and Representative Clifford. Um, yes, we know that there were school districts that were teaching Native American history. Um, however, we know that some of it may have been very broad and it may not have been specific to Wyoming. Um, you know, I graduated from Lingle Fort Laramie High School, so I learned about the Fort Laramie Treaty. Um, but it, it really, um, this was to make sure that uh, there was a, a greater effort being made on this area, especially specific to, um, as it's in the law, the history, culture, and contemporary contributions of Native Americans in Wyoming. Follow up. Thank you, Madam Trim. Um, I have a constituent and actually a person <laughs> serves on the tribal council for the Eastern Shoshone reach out to me. So we, we have a draft legislation that they have concern about and I heard from other tribal constituents as well this Civics Transparency Act, is it gonna affect, you know, what we wanna do with the Indian Education for All as far as curriculum? And um, I haven't read that bill thoroughly, but you know, I know it talks about critical race theory. And so there's some concerns that if this draft bill should pass, you know, that's being drafted, is it gonna impede, you know, the intent of this Indian Education for All bill? Ms. Akins? Madam Chairwoman and Representative Clifford, um, to my knowledge, it will not. It does not repeal anything that is in our Indian Ed for All Act. It still has the same requirements. Um, and the schools, their curricular materials have to teach the standards that have been approved and signed into effect. So um, under that civics transparency bill, I believe that, that you know, the resources that schools are using to teach Indian Ed for All would then have to be published on their website. Um, but the requirements for schools to teach to those revised social studies standards and the requirement for the department to make appropriate curricular resources and materials available on its website, those requirements do, would not change were that bill to pass. Other questions from committee members? I do have some about the accountability and I think, you know, I serve on education, so I think I know the answer to this question, but what, what about those districts that read those standards? Um, I don't believe there's an assessment tool that's uniform. Um, so those districts that say, nah, we're just too busy. We can't take this on. Um, how do you monitor for that? And then if you found that there is non-compliance, um, what's the remedy? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. So that would all take place through our accreditation process, which, review, which um, is an annual process, but also every five years, 
there's required to be an on-site review, which specifically must include a review of the school district's district assessment system. The district assessment system is where we look for that standards alignment and to make sure that the entire basket of goods is being offered. And so if it was found that they had nothing in their district assessment system, and as you mentioned, there's no um, uniform statewide tool on this, so it would need to be within that local district assessment system that we would see that they are checking um, to ensure that students are learning the standards relevant to uh, Indian Ed for All in Wyoming. And if that's found not to be true, any deficiencies in district assessment system do have to be reported to the state board, and it would um, have an effect on the accreditation recommendation that's made to the state board as well by the department. Miss follow up, Miss Jenkins. Do you know if the state board has um, removed the accreditation of any of our districts in recent history? So we have not had, uh, Madam Chairwoman, complete removal of accreditation. However, there are four levels of accreditation, and we have had schools um, that do not that are not at the fully accredited level. There is accredited with follow up. Um, or accredited with support in which there are then different requirements for them to report progress on the areas where they were not able to be fully accredited. But um, just another follow-up, it doesn't impact funding. It, it just requires additional monitoring to try and ensure compliance. Is that the only penalty, if you will, for a district non, a district's non-compliance? Sure. Madam Chairwoman. So there are a couple of areas where there may be non-compliance. If they are not fully accredited, we will not let them host a virtual education program, a full-time virtual education program. And then also if they go um, multiple years being accredited with support, then we also automatically um, lower their school performance rating in our accountability system in which they must do a more robust school improvement plan and activities with the department. So in year one, it is mainly just the department working to support the school district to get them to where they need to be. If it continues for several years, then there are more and more actions that are required to be taken by that school district. And then one other question, if a parent, you know, is aware of this act and receives some, looks at their kid's homework, and I'll tell you, this happens to me. Sometimes mm -hmm. I see the, you know, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, and I'm like, wow, this is it. Like, didn't we pass something to try and get this? provide a little bit more substantive content, even for our younger kids, what should they do? And what's the process for parents? Is Should they be contacting their local board? Should they be contacting the state board? Or should they be contacting your office if they have concerns that the spirit of the law isn't matching the standard or the, the spirit of law isn't being followed? Yeah. So Madam Chairwoman, in um, Wyoming, the statutory framework puts all, gov all um, authority over curriculum uh, that is used in classrooms at the local school board level. The superintendent has a constitutional prohibition from prescribing textbooks, and the State Board of Education has a statutory uh, prohibition from requiring specific curriculum or um, through their standards process. So that's why uh, with the department having to have the web page that provides curricular materials, we have multiple, it's still up to the school district to choose which curricular materials they think are the most appropriate and they are not required to use the materials that are vetted through the department. It is um, that authority on choosing those materials is completely up to that local school board. Thank you so much. Further questions for the Department of Education? Uh, Mr. Co-Chair? Okay. Mr. Black, did you wanna offer any remarks? Madam Questions. Chairwoman, he was my safety net. <laughs> uh, I do, I would ask Mr. Black, could you provide us with a quick update of how the Indian Ed virtual conference went this year? Madam Chairman. A big, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, it was a, we think a pretty good success. It was the second year we went online with it. It was the uh, the 12th annual. The first 10 were, were all either on the reservation or here at this campus. Uh, we had 457 registrants, which was up 30 from last year. Was, the numbers weren't as high as the last time we were in person when we had about 650 people show up in person here at, at Central Wyoming College. The reviews were pretty good. We had three keynotes and, and they were all uh, reviewed very well in our post-conference evaluation. And a lot of the comments on the breakouts were, were, uh, were generally fell into excellent or very good. So. Uh, we got some good feedback. Of course, there's always some wrinkles, especially when you're doing something entirely online, but overall it was a success. 
questions for Mr. Black, Mr. Co-Chair? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Rob, it, it, as I looked at your invitation to that this year, it looked like it was gonna be an opportunity for other districts around the state to come and have the opportunity to learn maybe some techniques and whatnot, how to implement Indian education for all. It, it, if that was indeed the case, was uh, can you kind of fill us in on how that went, if, if any did come and participate? Mr. Black. Madam Chairman and Mr. Co-Chairman, yes. Uh, we, in recent years, we've had more attendees from outside the Fremont districts or the districts really close to the reservation. This year we had 13, last year 17 of the 48 districts. So we, we fell off a little bit this year, uh, but still 13 total districts. And I believe we had representation from nine or 10 states, which was up a little bit from, uh, we had people from a community college in New York to people in New Mexico, California, and Colorado. Still the bulk, 93% of our attendees are from Wyoming, uh, which is not surprising. And the bulk of those are from Fremont County. But the, one of the pluses of the, the Zoom conference is we have been able to attract more people from around the state that normally couldn't travel here in August and from around the country. So generally, yes, to answer your question, I, I believe the Indian Ed for All um, implementation going into effect this fall has prompted more interest. And it, essentially since the bill was passed, I, we've noticed either anecdotally or people telling me in person, they love that conference because we do offer sessions exactly to help people match uh, their curriculum or their lesson plans to the Indian Ed for All standards. Other questions for Mr. Black? Um, along those lines, for the upcoming conference, I know 2022 seems so far away, but I'm just kind of curious, your initial conversations, are you thinking of trying to go in person, maybe a hybrid, or just sticking with the virtual another year? I'm just kind of curious to know what your thinking is this far out. Madam Chairman, we're right now planning on two tracks. One, if we are forced to go virtual again, and the other, if we can get back in person. We probably don't have to make a final decision till about March because it takes a certain amount of time to get all the presentations into a platform we call Canvas that uh, is, is used for conferences and, and it's also used for, by teachers and, and professors, but it works well for conferences where all the Zoom links are there and all the presentation materials of each speaker. But so March roughly is our drop dead date. We would love to have it back here. Uh, it, because uh, Central Wyoming College has always been a great host and uh, we're just, there's just too many question marks right now. So leaning possibly, I guess, toward getting it back in person, but keeping our options open because this pandemic has, offered, has thrown us so many curveballs. But so we're, we're planning it on two tracks, Madam Chairman. Thank you. It, have you discussed the hybrid option of having the in-person? But I, I do like this notion of for people who have difficulty traveling or have concerns about attending an in-person conference. A hybrid option has that been discussed madam chairman the hybrid options we've discussed are not where you come here in person you can watch it watch a presentation say in this room and someone in tallahassee florida can watch it on zoom uh, there's too many logistical issues with trying to set up a camera we don't have the manpower uh, to because normally when we have it on this campus we have as many as 12 or 13 breakouts going on at the same time so it would be difficult to to simulcast or live stream every every session our our idea of a hybrid would be a lot of the sessions are in person and then some would be online if the presenter can't travel here uh, but but a full what's considered a full hybrid where every live session is also live streamed we're just, we just don't have the capacity for that. Understood, thanks. Any other questions for the Department of Education? Alrighty, thank you. This information was really helpful. I appreciate it. But it makes me curious about Montana's funding system. We can talk about that later. Madam Chairman and, Co and Mr. Co-Chairman, thank you so much. It's always an honor to visit with you. Alrighty, we also have a representative from Wyoming PBS, welcome. And please introduce yourself on the mic. I'm Terry Dugas, General Manager of Wyoming PBS. Madam Co-Chairwoman, Mr. Co-Chairperson, Co-Chairman, thank you. Members of the committee, thank you. The select committee almost seven years ago was instrumental in 
acquiring legislative funding for what we now call the Wind River Education Project. And so every year I try to come before the committee and give you an update of the status of that project. You have a copy of a PowerPoint presentation that's developed by our project director, Michelle Hoffman. I'm not going to go through it. I'm just going to give you a little bit of additional uh, information. For the last two years, the Wind River Education Project has been self-funded by Wyoming PBS. We believe it's part of our mission of service to the state. Um, I have not nor will not um, approach the legislature for additional funding. We have not approached the Department of Education for additional funding. It is part of our core. It is part of our core mission. One of the things that makes this a little bit different in the state is that all of our lesson plans are developed by Native American educators. And in fact, in watching yesterday's session, I was pleased to see a number of the educators who are part of our teacher cohort, either appearing here before the committee or in the audience. Whenever possible, we also involve the tribes in the production of the learning objects. Uh, Chairman Dresser, for example, uh, has been involved as the associate producer on several Wyoming PBS productions. One of the questions that y'all asked her earlier was, in effect, anybody using this stuff? There's no way short of doing a survey of every classroom in the state to say with any certainty, but what we can say is that in the past year, the classroom learning objects have been viewed over 25,000 times. Somebody's watching it. And these are the learning objects that are accessible through the two education portals, either the Wind River EDU website or the PBS Learning Media website. So we're relatively confident that this use is classroom, student, teacher directed. And that's formal education. What I wanted to talk to you all about really today is informal education. These videos are positive expressions of the culture and history and people of both tribes on the reservation. And they're also available through Wyoming PBS's video on demand channels. These are outside of the two classroom portals. On these video on demand channels, these positive messages have been viewed over 1,200,000 times. That's a lot of positive impressions. In addition, several of the learning objects came from full length Wyoming PBS documentaries. And these documentaries have been shown nationally on PBS stations. We hope this informal positive exposure provides some small counterbalance to the traditional negative media coverage that the tribes receive. And uh, that's a very brief summary of what we've been up to for the past year. And I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Duga? Thank you so much. And thank again, you. thank you for helping us uh, broadcast this meeting today. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Is there any public comment on Indian Education Act for All? Alrighty. Seeing none, um, or the next item on our agenda is um, economic development. Um, we are a little ahead of schedule, so I want to make sure that um, we give, see if we can find a way to coordinate and get the um, next presenters ready. So how about we take a 10 minute break just to see if we can um, speed things along a little bit. So we'll come back at 9.20. Is, is Director Durrell in that way?
Good morning. Are we, are we live? Okay, we're calling this meeting back to order. Welcome. We have a special guest in um, our meeting today. Welcome, Governor Gordon. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Mr. Co-Chairman, uh, members of the committee. It's an honor to be here. I uh, happen to be in the neighborhood and and your co-chair said, uh, come on down. We've, uh, uh, and I wanted to just uh, mention how important I think your work is. Uh, there are a number of issues, obviously, that the Wyoming and, and the both tribes share and concerns we have for the future jointly. And so it is an honor to have the chance to just say good morning and thank you for your work. Thank you, Governor. Did anyone have any comments or remarks they'd like to make? Uh, we know he's busy, so thanks for taking the time. Thank you, Governor. It's good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you all. My gosh, what a and what a beautiful building this is too. Um, what a what a remarkable uh, asset. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Have thanks a great day. You too. Alrighty, members, the next item on our agenda is economic development programs, tribal inclusion, and we had some uh, legislation that we looked at at our last meeting that's been carried over to this meeting. But first, I want to welcome um, Josh Durrell, who's the CEO of the Wyoming Business Council. Uh, come on up and please introduce yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Uh, Members of the committee, my name is uh, Josh Durrell. I'm the CEO of the Wyoming Business Council. All righty. Heather, would you mind um, walking us through the bill drafts 22 LSO 0098, please? Madam Chairman. Yes, Mr. Co-Chair. So, Madam Chairman, if I may, I I'm maybe just reflect back on what we done uh, at our last meeting, which was uh, this was to remind the committee that this bill came via uh, the tribal liaison and the, uh, and the uh, Wyoming Business Council because some of the programs that administered the business ready community program um, has not been uh, available to the tribes per se because of statutory language that this administration and previous administrations, I think, uh, Director Durrell suggested that the last time they were able to participate in the program was maybe 2007. And so we've been trying to, at their recommendation, trying to clean up these statutes. And the last time uh, we met, we, we had um, some recommendations. This committee further uh, amended and give direction back to us one of the concerns was, as we heard about the history of the bill, was in our current statute, it, it, it tells who can qualify, which is cities, towns, and counties. Then later it says that the tribes can participate with a cooperative agreement. And there was some thought that maybe that was, that was separate because of a constitutional requirement. We had LSO look at that. They found that there's if we move that up, um, yet to the other section, that there's not a constitutional question. It cleans it up. It tied took care of that ambiguity that we saw existed, and we do that throughout. So that's kind of was the suggestion that we had talked about last time. And so, uh, Heather, if if we could maybe from that point carry on and show us the changes we have made and what the uh, um, repealers are, we can. Thanks, Heather. Madam Chairwoman, just to walk through working draft 0 0.8 of 22 LSO 0098, this revision of the bill, um, as you'll, you'll notice, is, is, has re been reduced in size. It's, it's a simpler than the previous one from a, um, the, the last meeting. So this one, this bill still has the um, title of clarifying that the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho tribes may participate in specified economic development programs. It omits 
the separate cooperative agreements for participation, as Chairman uh, Larson just described, and makes conforming amendments. So beginning at the bottom of page one is a list of the statutory um, the, the sections that are affected in this bill. And so at the top of page two is the first one. All of these that are affected are in Title IX um, and, and in Chapter 12, which are these economic development programs of the Wyoming Business Council. So in the purpose of the Business Ready Community Program, which is the 912-601 set of the, or 912-600s in Article 600, um, for the Business Ready Community Program, the purpose, it specifies that to promote economic development at the city, town, county levels and on the Wind River Reservation. So it adds it into the purpose for as far as of the that program overall. And then in subsection B, when it lists that um, the, uh, who can apply, it, is, it inc includes the the Northern Arapaho, Eastern Shoshone tribe, or the cooperative governing body among the two, um, it, it lists those in the list of people who may um, apply. So it says, so the sentence overall indicates that any city, town, county, or the Northern Arapaho or Eastern Shoshone tribe or the cooperative governing body may submit an application to the council for a grant or loan under this program. So that way they're just part of the list of who can apply and, and it's just kind of simply listed there. And that, then um, that, that section, subsection B is quite a long subsection. And you'll notice at the bottom of page three, there had been a reference to cooperative agreements. So it, it had said all grants, uh, loans or cooperative agreements made under this article shall be referred to the council um, for, for approval or the um, state loan and investment board, but this just takes out the cooperative agreement. So that way, that's just one of the conforming amendments that you'll see more of as we go through the bill to take out references to cooperative agreements because um, once we get to the repealer section of this bill, you'll see that all of those cooperative agreement sections have been just eliminated so that there's not confusion, so that it doesn't look like there's some separate process or anything. So then we go into 912602. So we're still with the Business Ready Community Program. And that is one of these um, conforming amendments to, ref to remove reference to a cooperative agreement. And, and that's the sentence is simply saying that funds in the account are continuously appropriated to the council to be used only for grants or loans authorized through this article and striking cooperative agreements. Now moving to Article 8 in this same Business Council Economic, Developments, uh, Economic Development section of the statutes. This is the Wyoming Community Facilities Program. And right here in the amended subsection C, it, we've done the same, or the bill does the same that it did um, for the other program. And it just lists the Northern Arapaho or Eastern Shoshone tribe or the cooperative tribal governing body in the list of people or of entities that may submit an application to the council for a grant or loan under that program. And then subsection E, um, actually specifically um, par paragraph two of subsection E is another a conforming one where the bill strikes cooperative, a reference to a cooperative agreement. And the same with subsection F. Also in, sub in this Wyoming Community Facilities Program, the, the um, 9-12-803, there is um, another reference just a, a same same program, but it's a reference to the cooperative agreements. And so that is stricken. So it says something very similar to the previous program to say that the council shall prioritize proposed grants and loans. It recommends to the state um, loan and investment board without the reference to the cooperative agreement. Then there, there's another um, title in the section that is, or sorry, another statute in this um, article that had a reference to cooperative agreements. At the bottom of page six at 9-12-902 um, is the beginning of the work for the Wyoming Workforce Housing Infrastructure Program. And their subsection A is where the, the similar amendment to what we've just seen in the two other programs, listing the Northern Arapaho or Eastern Shoshone tribe or the cooperative tribal governing body and in the list of 
entities who may submit an application for the, to the council for a loan under that program. And then another um, statute in that same article, 9-12-903, uh, deletes the cooperative agreements. So that's a co one of the conforming amendments. And the same with 905. And at this point, I'm on page eight that, with that reference. Then at the bottom of page eight is the section two, and this is the repealer section. And this repeals 9-12-601H, 9-12-805, and 9-12-902J. Those were the separate subsections or separate uh, section or subsection, depending on which program they were in, that referred to that a separate um, cooperative agreement may be made with the tribes. And the staff comment on page nine is basically what Chairman Larson said at the beginning of introducing this topic. Uh, it ex the, the staff comment explains what each of those um, uh, sections on cooperative agreements were and that those were had been included so that to, to confirm that the tribes could be included in these programs. This is now being done a different way through this bill draft. And um, then it also addresses the idea of the, that there, um, the, this points to a couple, I think it did. Uh, yes, it, 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 it says that there has not, that, that we were unable to find or uncover from some of the legislative history, um, some, um, le uh, some constitutional reason or other discussion of why those that there that is if there's any need for the cooperative agreements to be in place and then it also um, says that there was discussion about um, that, that how at least some of the monies that originate from severances on the minerals produced on the Wind River Indian Reservation and that this has been uh, intended for them to be part of these programs so um, that it is at least conceivable that the terms of a loan or grant to a tribe may differ from the terms of loan, uh, loan or grant, but this through as they the, the process is that they would apply to the business council for this. And then when, and when actually being issued a loan or a grant, that's when the documents um, that secure the loan or a grant would be um, discussed with either tribe or a joint governing body and would then be, um, uh, would be secured or executed between the parties, the business council and either tribe or both tribes. And then um, the effective date. Questions for Ms. Jarvis? Thank you, Heather. I, I, no, I, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Clifford. Yep, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I, this is good. It's looking good. And I just kind of wanted clarification. So can you specify or just remind me again um, what defines a cooperative tribal governing body on page four, line 13? Can you just clarify that for me again? Like what would, who would that entail? Yeah. What's Heather? the intent? Uh, the cooperative tribal governing body was an, an attempt to uh, use language that wouldn't refer to a, a specific name of the joint business council or the intertribal Business or intertribal council, because those names um, may change over, or their com composition may change over the years. However, the um, but the the function of them to be some sort of cooperative body to look um, govern would would not be, and so this wants to, wants to not be beholden to a particular name. Just to clarify, later today we're going to be talking about another bill draft titled Tribal Reference Amendments, and this is to try and provide some conformity throughout all of our statutes and how we refer to our tribes. Um, right now, the, our stat, a lot of areas of our statute talk about the joint um, tribal council, which no longer exists. There's an intertribal council. So the term cooperative was um, developed to assume that if the intertribal council doesn't exist in some point in the future, that we have some kind of catch-all by referring to them as the cooperative. We've asked the tribes to weigh in on that legislation. I think if that changes, we might make an adjustment there, but that's where that language came from. Question. Mr. Um, Co-chair, and and actually we had a, we had an intertribal language I think in there. Uh, Chairman Ellis and I uh, met with the intertribal councils a couple of weeks ago, 
and we're reviewing this bill and then the, the, the next bill, which is updating all the language in the statutes. And Chairman St. Clair caught that and said, well, why, why don't we put in this bill that language that we're going to be using in the next bill? And we thought that was a good catch. And so that's the language. We changed that language to conform with, with the other bill. Question? I don't think there's a motion. I'm trying to ask a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Case. Um, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, the term uh, cooperative uh, tribal agreement or um, organization, I, I'm wondering if we might, to be very clear, we might say that it's approved by both business councils. And somewhere, if we were to define what that is, I'm not saying it's necessary. I, I actually love, love this bill. I think it's really a great improvement over certainly what we saw in this committee um, last time and over the existing language. So, but um, the, the notion of cooperative agreement or cooperative uh, uh, governing, governing entity, we may define that somewhere as being um, approved by both councils so that it's not, you know, so that it's clear it's the cooperating entity or something like that. I'm not saying it's necessary, but it might provide clarification. Madam Chairwoman, Souther. Senator Case, that is uh, one aspect to the bill that we will be addressing later. There is a definition for the cooperative tribal governing body. Should it come to pass that both bills don't go, it seems like that, should that, the second bill not go, it most likely a definition, that definition ought to be moved um, here so that it is defined and in uh, whatever you want the definition to be, but the, that might be a wise thing to do, to have it, the term. So defined. Madam Chairwoman, thank you. Thank you very much for that. I, I think exactly it, it should be here and maybe have the same language and then, and even re reference the same section and let LSO figure it out between the two bills as it goes forward. Any other questions for Heather? Seeing none, thank you, Heather. Okay, the bill's been oh, moved. Public, public comment. Well, I asked if you had any comments. I don't, you said no. Are you just here to answer questions or did you want to offer opening remarks? I, I thought we were going to do that, but I apologize. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, thank you, uh, members of the committee. I, I do want to just reiterate that. Uh, that there were a number of projects that were undertaken in the, the Business Ready Communities um, program in 2006 and 2007. I believe there were three or four projects at that time. But since that time, there has not been a project brought forth. And um, it, it kind of tells me that this question of uh, eligibility and, and providing clarity has been around for a while. And uh, a number of administrations have, have probably looked at that or, or, or uh, you know, maybe wrestled with it a bit or, or haven't addressed it. And, and when, when we saw a project come toward us, we, we felt like, hey, we really need to fix this. We really need to work on that. And so I think that's the work that, that uh, we wanted to provide is some clarity. And I, I appreciate the efforts um, by this committee to do so. Um, it, it definitely makes our jobs easier to be able to, uh, to take uh, uh, those, those applications in and understand eligibility from the get-go. So, you know, thanks for the work uh, here and, and just uh, wanna, wanna let you know that uh, there aren't any particular projects pending right now. Uh, I think the urgency is, is not really high, but I believe this clarity is important. So thank you. Questions for Mr. Gurrell, Senator Case. Thank you, and thank you for being here, Mr. Durrell, uh, Director Durrell. Um, do our AGs think that this fixes it? Do your AGs? Mr. Durrell. Uh, uh, Madam uh, Chairwoman and, and uh, Senator Case, uh, I'm, I'm not at, at liberty to, uh, to, to discuss that particular uh, piece. Uh, I know there have been conversations around that, um, but, uh, but I can't really speak to that. Okay, fair enough, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Other questions for Mr. Durrell? Um, I, I have a question then. So tell me again, there are two projects you said in 2006 and 2007, you said they were brought, but were they funded? Uh, Madam Chairwoman, it's, it is way before my time. I don't know the, the exact details. I believe that they, um, they were brought forth. I don't know about the funding and, and I'd be happy to supply that. I don't believe that, uh, um, I don't have that in, data in front of me right now. 
Okay. And the reason I, might, I asked, I might be able to ch check with my staff though and see. And no, and the reason I asked was what the process would have been and how they would have defined cooperative agreement back then. And when the, if it was funded, that would have kind of, I thought would have assumed maybe laid the foundation of how future requests would be handled. So that's why I was curious about that. Uh, Madam, Madam Chairwoman, uh, I'm curious about it too. Um, but it's a uh, it's a very long time ago, and uh, in my 18 months, I haven't uh, haven't been able to uh, suss all of that information out. And then, Mr. Durrell, just so we're clear on the intent of this bill, this just talks about projects that are eligible. But the Business Council, to my understanding, has concerns and prohibitions on tribal um, enterprises applying for funds. Is that a fair statement? Um, Madam Chairwoman, not in my experience. Um, we don't have, we just want to make sure that the entity is eligible for the program to follow the statute. I, I don't know of any concerns or worries about tribal entities utilizing the program if they're eligible. Okay. I think that's my concern, committee members, is, you know, we just don't know what the problem was with the definition of cooperative agreements. I do think this makes it clear. Um, so I wish we had that information. Um, thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Durrell? Madam Chairman. Mr. or Senator Case. Um, so it's interesting to me, we haven't made any funding under the Business Ready Communities Program, but um, for example, there have been grants from Select Water to tribal entities, and it was all supposed to be kind of connected. And, you know, the, the, the references in one state program were supposed to kind of connect to the others. So um, certainly water development makes funding, I don't know the, the wording of that funding grants, but certainly they do. I do recall, and I'm following up on Madam Chairwoman's question about uh, um, a, a denial to a one tribal entity. I believe there was a denial at one time to a telecommunications proposal. Um, it wasn't because it was a tribal entity. I think there was other complicating things about that. And so I'm, I'm just, you know, that was before your time, um, and it involved uh, uh, right away and competing with other companies, and it was just complicated. So uh, uh, that may be what you're thinking of. So, thank you. Further questions for the director? Seeing none, thank you for being with us today. My pleasure. Thank you. Is there any public comment on this legislation? Welcome and please identify yourself for the record. Uh, Claire Johnson, attorney for the Northern Arapaho tribe. Um, so on this, I wanna thank the committee for their work. Um, I like that it's a voluntary option that gives the tribes the decision whether they want to participate or not, but mm -hmm. allows them to participate within the state program. Mm -hmm. uh, also when the tribe was incorporated into the list of city, town and counties, um, I also appreciate the tribe, the Wind River Reservation being listed last and separately because it gives reference to its distinct status and the difference between it being a city and the, and the county. Overall, I think this is a great bill that gives the tribes the opportunity to participate. And I just wanna thank you for your efforts. Thank you, questions? Thank you for your testimony. Would anyone else like to comment on this bill? Welcome. And Councilman, you, would you mind turning off that microphone? I don't know if it'll create a buzz, but that would be great. Thank you. Good morning, committee, chair, co-chair. Um, Eastern Shoshone Business Council has looked at this piece of legislation and uh, we are in agreement with Northern Arapaho Tribe that it's, it's uh, has good definitions, makes everything clear, uh, specifies that maybe if the tribes were already eligible for putting in for some of these grants, it now actually makes it more clear that they are eligible to put in for these grants. Specifically, the I think it was the Wyoming Workforce uh, Infrastructure and the Community Land Trust projects uh, makes those really clear. And as such, we support this piece of legislation. Thank you. Questions for Councilman? Thank, Thank you. you so much for your comments. Any, would anyone else like to testify on this bill? Seeing none, public comment is closed. Committee, what's your pleasure? Do pass. The bill's been moved by Representative Clifford, I think seconded by Senator Case. Um, are there any amendments? Madam Chair. Representative Clifford. Yes, on page two, 
line six in red, we need to add the word Indian. So it would read levels and on the Wind River Indian Reservation. Okay. That would Catch. be my first amendment. Okay. Okay. Second. Second. It's been Question. moved and seconded. All in those in favor say aye. 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 Amendment's been adopted. Next proposed amendment. And Representative I, Clifford. On page two, um, lines 11 through 13. This is small, but it's important. Could we please list Eastern Shoshone tribe first? So it'd be or Eastern Shoshone tribe or the Northern Arapaho. Um, and that would go through on page four, lines 12 through 13, and also page six, lines 21 through 22. So again, reading or the Eastern Shoshone tribe or Northern Arapaho tribe or the cooperating tribal governing body. That's my amendment. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Discussion on the amendment. Uh, I just had a question. Um, just wanted to know the rationale. It, it's a fact that the initial history and the, the reservation was to the Eastern Shoshone tribe. So I wanna recognize that. And it's, it's, it's small, but meaningful, powerful impact. Further, com or further comments on the proposed amendment? Seeing none, there's questions called. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The amendment's passed. Any other um, amendments to the bill? Senator Case. Madam Chairwoman, can we, um, by reference and a little bit of a loose amendment, bringing, bring in the exact same definition from the exact same point in the statute so that there's duplication between the two bills about the cooperative governing body? And as we work that in the next bill or however, but make them overlap so that if either bill goes, it's in there. And, and uh, that's my proposal. Oh, Heather. Madam Chairwoman, the bill draft that is being referred to as 22 LSO-0110 and on page three of that bill in title eight of the statute that describes rules of construction for statutes, the uh, it, there's created a new paragraph 10 that say, states, um, oh, and, and sorry, this rules of construction for statutes are that for all statutes in the state, the, the following rules shall govern, and this creates an additional rule in, in paragraph 10 that's created in that statute and that would be then inserted into this bill draft and it would be no problem at all to have the exact same thing in both bill drafts. And that states reference to the cooperative tribal governing body means the intertribal council of the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho tribes or its successor joint governing body. If the cooperative tribal governing body is a party to a cooperative agreement or contract with the state or a political subdivision under the laws of this state, the successor joint tribal governing body shall remain a party to the agreement or contract unless specified otherwise in the agreement or contract. So that's a rule of construction for um, that would apply to these programs as well as um, throughout the statutes. Representative Larson. So Heather, Heather in the bill that we're working on, uh, in, as we make reference to that, for example, on page four of the, of the bill that we're looking at, we would have, or the cooperative tribal body as referred to in 8-1-103-10. Mr. Chairman, no, uh, okay. unless, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, Madam Chairwoman, not unless that's what you wanted it to say, but there would not be a need for it to, to, to refer to it. That's these rules of construction in okay. title eight are, um, they apply regardless. And that's what the subsection A I'm, at the head before that new added paragraph 10 says is that the construction of all statutes in this state shall be by the following rules, unless that construction is plainly contrary to okay. the intent of the legislature. So it's no need to refer to it. Thank you. Mr. Co-Chair, thanks. Okay, any other amendments to the bill? Wait, um, oh, I think there's a misunderstanding, perhaps. Okay, um, Senator Case. Um, Madam Chairwoman, so I think that Ms. Uh, Ms. Jarvis is saying that it's okay to put the same language in both bills. Madam Chairman, I think the way I heard it is is 81103 in construction of statutes mm -hmm. would then govern all the language that refers to cooperative tribal governing body in all statutes unless an, the other statute deviates from it 
in language. So, so Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Senator Case. That's only if the other bill passes. Um, because all I'm saying is, and we do this all the time, you have a bill that has overlapping yeah. things and, and we sort it out because one or, one or the other bill may not pass. It's possible for reasons that we don't even control. So just take the same language, put it in this bill. It's duplicative. I don't want to I want it to be the same in both bills. And it, it doesn't get in the law twice. It's just in both bills so that if one of the bills gets derailed, we still have it. So that's the only purpose. And I think that's what Ms. Jarvis said, um, that okay. we could incorporate that change in this bill as well. Um, and I'm just, that was my motion. And uh, I hope we could do that. And then if we, we fiddle with that definition, it would kind of be fiddled in this bill. We want them to be the same. So I hope I can get a second for the motion. Second. second. Um, Senator Case, um, I had a question as an alternative to, uh, just to discuss your motion. And you've been doing this a lot longer than the rest of us. I think another alternative would be that we monitor both bills. And if this um, second bill dies early in the process, we pick up that language that's on page three of the second bill and amend it if the, this bill goes on its own. That, and that might be another alternative, but I, I, I'm curious for your feedback on that strategy. Um, so Madam Chairwoman, mistakes happen in the legislature all the time. We, we drop balls. If, if we make a motion to put the exact same language in this bill, there, there will be no mistake, no matter what happens. Um, you know, people get their signals crossed. It's hectic. We have three minutes for introductory votes and things get moving fast. They go to different committees that are even this committee. So I just think it's like a belt and suspenders approach, but okay. we have two bills that refer to the same definition. Why not put them in both bills? Senator, Mr. Co-Chairman. So I understand the logic and it makes sense to me, although I just think it makes, it makes this longer and I would prefer not to have it in there unless it is needed. And it sticks in my mind that we've done as you suggest, Senator Case, and then that if both bills passes, it comes out of the subordinate, if you will, bill and right. Exactly. It gets fixed right at the end. Yeah. Okay. Heather? Madam Chairwoman, the, I, I'm not entirely sure what Chair, Chairman Larson means by comes out of, it would be a part of both bills. So for example, in if, if both bills pass, the session laws book would have this inserted 8-1-103A with the new paragraph X, it would be a, the text of both bills. Well, um, but, but what would happen, well, just period, it would be a part of both bills. Well, but could we not have it in this bill that we're considering to say that if the other bill passes, that this lengthy definition comes out of this bill and just lies in the other. Mr. Chairman, there are sometimes, uh, Madam Chairwoman, there are sometimes contingent bills that say, if X bill passes, then this appropriation is nil. Or for, for right. example, that's that has been done with an appropriation. There could be a separate section of this bill that inserts it that says if that bill passes, then this I section do. is null. I think I, I think that there could be something done like that. Um, it's that would um, it would actually in in effect make this bill longer because it would be a part of the text of this bill because then that contingency information would then be in this these session laws. Um, so it wouldn't ever just some, suddenly fall out unless it was taken out, I suppose, at a joint conference committee or something like that. Um, it, it, the, because the contingency language would be there and then the whole language would be there. So it, the um, having, it's the committee's choice is whether they want it just to be in section one or into a, in a separate section of its own. Mr. Chairman, um, Heather, there's a definition section in the business council. Um, authorization statutes, correct? I think if the good Senator um, from Fremont County would view this as a friendly amendment, how about this, um, just as an idea, 
the language that's in the second bill would be added as a definition in the business council section. And so it would be redundant in there twice in our statutes. And then we can monitor both bills as necessary. And if for some reason the second bill goes, we can, with an amendment, take out that extra language in the business council bill. Um, so I was, I was wondering if the, the good chairman of, or uh, my good colleague from Fremont County would view that as a friendly amendment would be to add the language about the what a cooperative governing body is into the definitions of the business council section and include that in this bill. Um, thank you for the suggestion, Madam Chairwoman. I don't think that would necessarily be friendly. Let me just posit something to you. Then you have a chain, a definition in the general statutory uh, construction section, and then you have a same thing. You're trying to put it in the business council, but just suppose that they slightly get tweaked over time so that they're in conflict. Um, um, then we potentially have a problem uh, if, and so, and then we're just actually making the statutes longer because we duplicated in both places. I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm failing to see the, the issue to referring to the general statutory construction amendment in both bills. I'm, I'm really not seeing a problem with that seems very consistent to me. And if one bill takes a path and the other, it's still in the other, and it still would change the, what a cooperative tribal governing body is. Um, so I would hope we'd go down that route, but you can vote her up and down. I do, when it comes time in the other bill, I wanna tweak that definition or try to. So I'm just letting you know. So Madam Chairman. Mr. Co-Chair. I, I just wanna, because I think it's critical that the definition in both statutes are the same. Mm -hmm. In the same place. And Heather, I just re recall a couple of years ago or, or last year, I can't remember when we'd done all the work on the con uh, uh, construction statutes, the public works, uh, uh, capital construction projects. We, we run into this and I, I remember asking, well, we now we have to conform this language because there's, there was a statute. There was a statute reference in one bill, and it was over here in another bill. And I said, "Well, don't we have to get all of this language?" She says, "No, we'll sort that at the end." And they were different bills. And she says, "We'll sort that at the end and make sure that the language con conforms to where it reads the same for that that statute." And that's why I was wondering if if we put that language in this bill and both bill passes, then the necessity if I'm understanding correctly, Senator Kate, the necessity of having that additional language in this bill goes away and the other would govern, or are you just wanting to keep it in there forever? <laughs> so, Madam Chairwoman. Senator Case, Senator um, Case. And Mr. Co-Chair, if, if it's in both bills, it would be in session law, you'd see it written twice because you'd have both bills in session law. But in the green books, it'd only be written once. And where would it be written? In under A one one zero three A Romanet X, only okay. one time. Yeah. And and so it's just that we have a bill that refers to the same place, so okay. that we're tied to the same place in both bills, in case uh, mm -hmm. and and just suppose that the opposite thing happened that there's a blow up, and somebody puts an amendment to this in both sections. Then we have to fix it and LSO will catch that and we will fix it, but it's important that it be consistently referenced. And that's all I'm coming about. I agree. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, Senator Case, I think I just don't understand your motion. So what, what do you want the language to look like? My motion is to bring in 81103A Romanet X from the other bill and make them consistent as we move forward today. So just to make sure I understand Senator Case, so on page two, you would say the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho tribe or the cooperative tribal governing body as defined in. Madam, Madam Chairman, it, it actually be a lot of conforming amendments. What it's gonna do is in section one, it would list eight, uh, I 
trying to flip it would list the particular section, 8110, I think, and, and as being an amended section. And then it would actually bring that in as an amendment. Um, and since it would be one of the very first things in the bill, then because it goes, um, it, would, it would be a change right there. The exact same language is in the other bill. And I think I've got that right, Heather, help me. If I've screwed it up. Madam Chairwoman, Senator Case, yes, the, uh, there would be an amendment to the title on line, uh, in lines somewhere around two to five, but then at line 10 on page one, uh, it would list that WS 8-1-103A by creating a new subsection X, and then it would say comma 92601 as is written there. And then effectively, when you turn the page to the top of page two, the first thing that you would see is 8-1-103 and the exact thing that is in the other bill inserted. Thank you, Heather. That helps me understand it. I got it now. <clears throat> and uh, Madam Chairwoman, I, I think Case. we could just do that. Um, when we discuss the other bill, perhaps, and my head clears a little bit, I, I think the actual t definition might need a bit of a tweak um, because it says reference to the cooperative tribal governing body means the intertribal council of the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho tribes or successor, successor joint governing body. And I'd like to insert something in there. And I, and I'm, I realize it's a bit preliminary. It says something like, established by agreement of both business councils, but I'm not even sure that business councils are defined in law, but I just want to be clear that that they establish the joint thing. Maybe that stands without, uh, we don't need to do that. Maybe it's just self-explanatory, but it seems to me that you could have enforced cooperative business that, that they don't necessarily agree with. So I'm trying to say that Whatever they decide it's going to be, and they establish, we recognize that. And I think if we could do it by tweaking that very slightly, and I realize <clears throat> I've caused a lot of time, and I'm sorry about that. Madam Chairman. Mr. Co-Chair. And just while we're on that conversation, I would just share with uh, the good senator that the, the two chairmen brought the other bill and that new language before both tribes and their attorneys, they liked it. Okay. okay. And so um, I hate, I hate to, I'll, I'll go with that. I, I hate to slip off in the, the weeds without them. Mm -hmm. You know, we've gone through that process to, to engage them and, and hopefully that that will, we don't piddle with it. <laughs> and uh, Madam Chairman, thank you very much for the leeway. Um, you bet. I'm just trying to make, uh, avoid saying we're going to force you to have this joint thing or the federal government's going to force you or whatever. That is a voluntary joint governing body that that is uh, organically comes from their own government. Okay, so the motion is to incorporate the language found in the second bill draft defining what a cooperative tribal governing body is into um, adding that same uh, new creation of that statute um, into the current bill draft. Um, any questions on that motion? All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion's been adopted. Any other comments or amendments to the bill? Questions, questions being called, um, will you take a roll? This is a roll call on uh, bill draft 22 LSO 0098 version eight as amended. Okay. Senator Case. Senator Salaz Salazar, uh, Representative Blackburn, Aye. Representative Clifford, Aye. Chairman Ellis, Co-Chairman Larson, Aye. six I votes. And Ms. And I feel like this request will go into ether, but I, I am concerned that we've addressed the Attorney General's concerns. We still haven't seen what the articulated concern is with this bill. We're guessing that this fixes it. Um, it would be helpful in my view to just have that confirmation, but. We've heard from the Attorney General's office. They like the bill. Thank you, Representative Larson. Okay, the next um, committee, do you wanna take a break or keep going? Let's go. Okay, let's keep going. So the next um, item on our agenda is the Tribal Reference Amendment Bill. Heather, welcome back to the dais and please walk us through this bill. Nope, 
There we go. Madam Chairwoman, committee. This bill draft is working draft 0 0.6 of 22 LSO-0110. This bill draft is, uh, um, the, I'm going to go through the kind of lengthy title because it does several things. So it specifies the definition and rule of construction for the cooperative tribal governing body. That's the thing that we've just been discussing or that the committee was just discussing um, and that, uh, in Title VIII. It clarifies statutory references to either or both tribes. It corrects references from the obsolete Joint Business Council to the cooperative tribal governing body. The bill standardizes references to either tribe or the cooperative governing body. And it clarifies indigenous language references in curriculum requirements. The bill draft corrects references to the Wind River Indian Reservation. And it repeals the obsolete Wyoming Indian Affairs Council. And so beginning at page two is, uh, at, and for the first half of page two is the list of all of the statutes that are amended. I'm not going to read through those. We will just look at those as we can get to them because at the bottom of page two is the first one. This particular change is a reference to the Wind River Reservation and it is inserting Indian. On page two, this is 8-1-103A, creating a new paragraph X that we just read. And this is the, the in the rules of construction for all statutes. So this applies across all of statutes. If it is ever seen in all of statutes, which it will be because you'll see in the rest of this bill draft that there will be the term cooperative tribal governing body, then this is what that means. Then at the bottom of page three, the reference uh, it, this is about tribal identification cards, and this does a capitalization of tribe, and then it takes the E off of Arapaho so that the um, word Arapaho is spelled consistently throughout the statutes. On page four at 9-12-601, this is, um, oh, we're actually about to enter several, 9-12, statutes, and so these refer to business council statutes, some of which you've just seen. And one thing that the committee will want to do is this bill draft simply um, was to try to make the references be the same between the tribes. And the other bill draft was trying to clarify that they can participate. Now, they um, this one goes a bit further than the other one does, but they're not necessarily in conflict. And that is um, 601, 805, and 902. Um, actually, also 1201. I, I'm looking at several pages, all of, of the 9-12 ones and 1501. So through page six, it's trying to make the, the language consistent so that the, it always says Eastern Shoshone tribe, the Northern Arapaho tribe, or the cooperative tribal governing body. So you'll note in 9-12-805, oh, so Mr. Co-Chair, <laughs> so sorry, this is actually repealed in the other bill, so there's that's, not a conflict. Was, that's just what I was going to say. Exactly. If the other bill didn't pass, this would be applicable in this bill. Right. But but in the other bill, we delete this 9-12-805. And so what will happen is that during the session, um, it will come to the LSO, hey, there's a conflict. Both, this, both bills do something with 9-12-805. And um, it will need to be resolved because this is not one that is just simply resolved like the, the one that we were describing where it's the same thing and it's just inserted into statutes. Because if one bill is repealing it and one is amending it, the, the question will be what, what will you want to do? This is something that the committee could address now by um, repealing this. However, it wouldn't have then the amendments of the WBC um, bill the uh, Wyoming Business Council bill, or during session, this might this would be one that um, the con committee had just expressed the turn the concern with the previous bill of something falling through the cracks. This is a check that happens the um, LSO. It's actually towards the um, right around the crossover. We are all given a, a by we I mean the um, LSO staff. We're given a note that says, "Hey, here are some conflicting provisions." So we would be bringing this to to your attention of what would you want to do. So it it's. While nothing is certain on the floor at the legislature, this would be, we would be out there saying, um, 
you know, what do you want to do? You want to reconcile this now, because this would be a conflicting provision that to have 805 repealed in one and corrected and um, amended here. So um, the way to proceed is most likely, well, however the committee wants, but most likely to leave it in and then we'll call it to your attention during the session. Um, Mr. Co-Chair, can you speak a little bit about whether or not we pass both bills and this is repealed in a, could this be addressed in the repealer bill the following session to take out and make sure that, that our intention is clear to repeal these in a subsequent year with the, through the reviser bill. Is that how that works too? Or could that work that way? Madam Chairwoman, most likely not. The reviser bill it tends to be um, corrections. And as to whether the actual intent was to repeal this, if it somehow didn't get repealed, that would that's substantive and not really reviser bill material. But it would take place during session. We would say, this is being repealed. Do you want it repealed here too? And but is this, Madam Chairman, is this not a situation? So we have on, on this page, this, we're looking at 912.805, and then on the next page, we have 912.902.J, which is, 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 this, is deleted in the other bill. Is this not one that we could have a section in here I, in this bill identifying that if the previous bill passed, which repeals those, that these would come out? Madam Chairwoman, Mr. Chairman, that would be a great um, section to, to have a contingency statement in this one bill draft because this is more, it's not just a cleanup bill. There are sub, some substance, but to have a section that say, that lists those and say to repeal them instead, that if that were to pass. And that that would be um, some some way of working that, that um, with a bit of leeway to get the right language in there to LSO to get that, that would be a good um, amendment. Okay, okay. Yes. thank you. Okay. Please proceed. Okay, so. And um, page four, 912601, 912805, 912902, and 912.1501, and 912.1501. Those should all not, uh, they should all have the language of that the, um, the Eastern Shoshone tribe, Northern Arapaho tribe, or the cooperative governing body to be consistent between those. Um, and th th that, that's what the, the, this particular bill is just doing is trying to make that consistent so that they all indicate that those are who may, um, who, who are listed in those sections. And then we'll, uh, if the committee chooses, put the, uh, the thing to make it consistent, um, and for 601, 805 and 902. The thing that this bill would continue to do that wouldn't conflict with the bill that the committee just voted to sponsor is on the bottom of page five. This is another of the business council's um, uh, programs. And this, the way that that particular program specified that the tribes could participate is it includes them in the, the definition for agency. And so all what it is doing on page five lines 20 through 23 is making the references be consistent so that it said the cooperative tribal governing body, the Eastern Shoshone tribe, the Northern Arapaho tribe, or joint powers board are, are things that comprise an agency. So that would remain in this bill draft. And then also on page six, um, the way that that business council program, which is the broadband development program, it does something similar that it lists folks who, who are or entities that are able to participate. And one of them is that sub um, paragraph B, where you, you'll notice it says a tribal government of either the Northern Rapo or Eastern Shoshone tribes of the Wind River Indian Reservation or the cooperative tribal governing body. So th those would remain. Now, moving at the bottom of page six, to Title 14, which is the children's statute. This um, refers to um, that statute. It's about body art, but what the amendment is doing is just changing Arapaho to be spelled correctly without the E. And that's on page seven. Page eight is an amendment also in Title 14, and that is also changing Arapaho, the spelling of Arapaho. Title 16, which is in the um, county statutes, 
it, uh, there, there's a reference to Wind River Reservation and this inserts Indian. Title 10, I'm sorry, page 10, Title 16 also. Um, this was a reference to the Joint Business Council. And so what it is doing is using that term cooperative, uh, the cooperative tribal governing body and some capitalization too. Title or page 11, this is also in Title 16. And that was a Joint Business Council reference to two of them, both in subsection A. And um, sorry, three in subsection A. Th subsection A goes all the way to page 12. So those are just changing that reference. Now in title, uh, on page 12, we've moved to the education statutes. And this is at title 21, subsection A, paragraph two, subparagraph A. This um, talks about certification of teachers of the Arapaho, Shoshone, or both languages. So this is a bit substantive because this had previously said the Arapaho and Shoshone language. And this is to indicate that it could be a teacher of either or both. And, uh, and it has their spelling also corrected. And then in Title 21, dash, I beg your pardon. Senator Case. Uh, apologize, but it seems like this might be a proper place. So that has uh, Rappo first and Shoshone second, but it's a, it's a reference, it's an adjective to the type of language and it's alphabetical. It seems appropriate to me, but uh, I, it's not the same as the other reference where we were uh, marking historic significance. So uh, I'm just throwing that out there. Um, thank you, Senator Case. My understanding is um, when we're talking about Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho, those are the federally recognized governing Bingo. bodies versus, um, you know, their adjectives. adjectives describing languages. Yeah. Um, good? So, and we can, you know, certainly if we want to switch around Shoshone, Arapaho, or both languages. No, I was saying it's good the way amendment. it is. Yeah. So please proceed. Page 13, it's the reference or the making the amendment in title or in, in statute 21-3-110, the actual change is not until we get to page 14. That's a super long section. And this is a reference um, from the previous meeting to instances in statute, uh, in the education statutes that talk about uh, training in foreign language and the committee um, wanted it to say foreign or indigenous language. So there are a few instances in this bill draft. This is, we're seeing the first one, but I'll point out a couple more that where we had added that language. On page 15, 21-4-601, this is an, um, an instance of, uh, this includes, um, these are some education programs, and this is a substantive change because it adds the possibility of it being a cooperative body, because previously the bill had just said that um, programs provided by the Eastern Shoshone, um, the Northern Arapaho, or Eastern Shoshone or Northern Arapaho, this um, Indian tribe. So this one says that the Eastern Shoshone, the Northern Arapaho, or the cooperative governing body to school age children. So this it just inserts one more entity that um, could possibly provide these programs. And that is the same that is done in subsection B of this of, of that bill draft. And then in subsection C, it is done um, three times in paragraph two, three, uh, in two and three, and then in subsection D. So what it's um, making the reference to the cooperative tribal governing body, but it's making this whole statute consistent that it may be either tribe or both tribes throughout this title 21-4-601. Then at 21-7-601, um, this, this is a reference to, and it begins on page 18, where they talk about the, there, there can be certification, certification as a special education, math, science, or foreign or indigenous language teacher. And that's the same, then that's in the subparagraph A as well as in subsection E, foreign or indigenous or foreign or indigenous language. And that um, the, these are these are making the reference to foreign not be um, every time it says foreign, um, also on page 19, you'll notice that there can be in the common core of knowledge, foreign or indigenous cultures. 
and then uh, in subsection G, instruction in foreign or indigenous language to students. And that particular one is about kindergarten through grade two. I'm not going into the sub, I'm just referring to each of the references and not where they are instructed in the um, education. But this is, but that's the change that's being made is foreign or indigenous. Bottom of page 19, uh, we are now in 21-16-1307. And this, this section also, these are about test standards. And one of the test standards is that they can be in foreign or I'm on page 20 in the, in the middle of the page, foreign or indigenous language. And the instruction in foreign or indigenous language shall be taken in grades nine through 12. And it's you know adding that to the statutes. Um, and the same on page 21, this refers to foreign or indigenous. And that particular subsection A had a spelling of Arapaho um, that is correct, corrected and referred to the, the same throughout the other ones. And then as we go to page 22, they, there's an, this is in, another, in another list of the school um, of the requirements and there's a reference to foreign. So now it says foreign or indigenous language and it corrected the spelling of Arapaho. And then 21-22-106, um, the bottom of page 22, has one additional um, reference to curriculum development activities, such as initiatives in foreign or indigenous languages. And, and the or indigenous is added at the top of page or middle of page 23. Next, moving into title 22, which are the election statutes. This, uh, the election statutes, there is a definition to tribal clerk and this uh, is somewhat substantive and also just to, to make it be um, consistent, it means an official designated by the Eastern Shoshone tribe, an official designated by the Northern Arapaho tribe, or an official designated by that um, cooperative tribal governing body. And it, there's also a reference to Wind River Indian Reservation, inserting that in there. Now, Title 24, which is the highway statutes. And this is, uh, there was a reference to the Wind River Reservation and this inserts Indian on page 25. Can I stop? Can I ask? Senator you Case? Um, is, it, is it okay to take a question right now? It's just on the section we just passed. Mm -hmm. And I, it just took me a while to think about it. I was I'm thinking sure. of you, Senator Case, yeah, so, getting your opinion on this. So uh, on page 24, it's in the election section and it's uh, the language, the new language says, uh, and it's about an election clerk or an election officer of some sort. Mm -hmm. And it says, or an official designated. Um, so it's clear that we can have different officials, I guess. I guess it is clear to me now that um, I, I think I, I think I solved it myself. I think it's okay. Because okay? I, I was worried that we were talking about one person and, and I think that's unlikely, so. Um, Madam Chairwoman, Senator Case, Ms. Jarvis, you are the expert in this um, tribal, without any amendments, this would um, refer to uh, a tribal clerk being someone who um, is designated by the um, Eastern Shoshone. Mm -hmm. um, I think it had, or uh, this was an and or thing as well. Yeah, there we yeah, go. An official who is designated by the Eastern Shoshone and an official designated by the um, des uh, designated by the Northern Rappo, so that it was ambiguous or, or um, not ambiguous, but it was a little bit unclear of whether that was um, two different officials mm -hmm. or one each. And it, th this this amendment is slightly um, substantive, not slightly, it is entirely substantive, insofar as that um, there could be um, a completely separate official. In, in as an as a tribal clerk for the northern Arapaho, and there could be a separate one for the eastern Shoshone, mm -hmm. um, or they might jointly say, um, let's have the cooperative tribal governing body designate one person as the tribal clerk, and that would apply in elections. So uh, this it may not be the committee's intent to do that, or maybe it is to clarify it. I, I think I, I mean, case. just following up. I mean, I think we just have to think more about this. It's. It, um, and I, I might have it screwed up, but it seems like we're imposing some thinking that maybe um, is a structure that maybe doesn't necessarily apply. Uh, a lot of the important elections on 
the reservation involved the general counsel, for example, and how that, and, I, and I'm not sure what the implications are for Wyoming election code. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm open-minded, I think it's, but they may not have an election clerk. Or we, I mean, there's a lot of things that we're taking in a framework that I'm very familiar with in the corporation's world, and then trying to put it and say that it applies and we want them to designate this person. And I don't know if that's quite the right fit. So anyway, it's, it's awkward to me. Well, committee members, um, Representative Clifford, if it's okay, I, I want Heather to finish walking through the bill. I think this needs more discussion, but um, you know, we'll take some public comment on it. And if this is, I mean, but these are the very catches that we need to be making is, is it and, is it or, is it, is that what our intent to offer each tribe their own tribal clerk or this is all stuff we need to sort through. So good, good discussion, but we'll keep going through the bill draft. Okay, Madam Chairman, in Title 24, oh, we had addressed that one. This is a, there was a reference in the highway statutes to the Indian Wind River Indian Reservation. On page 25 is Title 35, and those are the public health statutes. And so this is 3525-205 um, in, in a breast and cervical cancer program. And there was a reference to, it just simply said Shoshone and Arapaho. So this particular um, change inserts Northern and Eastern. Northern Shoshone yeah, and Eastern Arapaho. Yes, Mr. Chairman, the Shoshone so and think, Arapaho were there. Think about oh. that. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Chairman, these two would be um, <laughs> clear, clear. changed. Yes, exactly. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ma Madam Chairwoman, I don't think that that even would need to be a committee amendment. That was is just something that needs to be fixed. Oops. <laughs> Thank you. Um, On page 26 in, at 35-25-301, this is a diabetes program. And this also adds, oh, it adds it correctly. Okay. <laughs> uh, in, in subsection B, paragraph three, it adds the word Eastern to modify Shoshone and Northern to modify Arapaho. And in title 36, these are the land, state lands titles. There was a re reference to the Shoshone Indian Reservation, and this makes it be the Wind River Indian Reservation. And there was a, a and then on page 27, the, the same thing. There, there are two different references to Shoshone Indian Reservation. And then on page, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> or I'm the chairman today. Hello. Um, back to the acceptance of the Bighorn Hot Springs. When that the term Shoshone, we're changing that to Wind River Indian Reservation. I think Wind River Indian Reservation is federally defined, but do we need, did we contemplate the need for um, how we have that catch all defining what a cooperative tribal um, entity is? Do we need to have a similar catch all that says any reference to Shoshone, the Shoshone Indian Reservation was later named by, you know, Wind River Indian Reservation, just some clarification. That one makes me a little nervous. Madam Chairwoman, there was some discussion of this at the last meeting, and I, um, I'm i not sure I captured whether there was the intent to add in, insert something like that. And um, I think that it, something like that would be appropriate in Title 36 rather than in Title 8 to across, apply across the board, but to look at uh, if there's some sort of overall definition section to just to title 36 for these these are all in um article three of title uh, of of chapter eight of title 36 and to put something there to refer to you know if the, the um shoshone indian reservation uh, that, that wind river indian reservation means the shoshone reservation as it as any land was um as recognized. By recognized, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you, Heather. Okay. And 
So that that would apply on page 27 as well, uh, whatever definition go, would go across to all three of those. Now on page 28, in Title 41, which are the water statutes, this uh, is, there was a reference to the Joint Business Council. So this inserts the, the term cooperative tribal governing body. And that happens on page 29 as well. And on page um, uh, 30. And, uh, the, and these references to the cooperative governing body and these are in the water statutes. And if there were some sort of contract, these the that insertion at Title VIII would apply because that insertion at Title VIII that says cooperative governing body applies across all, all of these statutes in, in as far as rules of construction. That would um, make any, if there were some water contract here that referred to an old um, to, uh, joint body, then it, it would make those, those contracts um, it would make the intent of the statutes to be that those would remain valid. And then at on page 30, there's another water statute and this particular one cleaned up the, the name Arapaho and added Eastern to Shoshone. And then on page 31, there's section two, which is the, um, the repeal of the Indian Affair, Wyoming Indian Affairs Council, and then the, the act is effective. And just to refer back to what we had stated earlier, if, if to, uh, that the intent to add a contingent section that if the, this other bill draft is passed, that titles or sections 9-12-601, 9-12-805, and 9-12-902, as in this bill, would um, be repealed. And so that that this is where it would go when I would talk to different sections, it would be here. Okay, questions for Heather from committee members? Thank you, that's a big bill. Uh, we'll now move to public comment. Would anyone like to speak on this bill? I'm seeing no, oh, Councilman Newt. Welcome. Mike you Shoshone Business Council. Um, I believe the Shoshone Business Council is fine with the cooperative tribal governing body uh, term. I think that's fine. I, I, I do believe, and this was just something that I caught as we were sitting there and I was trying to rack my brain on, on how to, uh, I, I guess do a kind of a fix for it. And it's on page three and it's just the, um, the first sentence of the paragraph X, reference to the cooperative tribal governing body means the intertribal council of the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho tribes or its successor joint governing body. Now, uh, this kind of leaves it up to interpretation of who decides what the joint governing body is. I mean, I know it's means uh, joint council or intertribal council. It, that's what it's was supposed to mean. However, this might leave it up to interpretation for tribal members to make their own uh, governing body. I, I think a simple fix here might be, or its official successor joint governing body. Now, I know it kind of brings a little confusion in when, when who decides what's official or, or not, but uh, when the state is asked, well, who's the official joint governing body? You, you know, obviously you can decide who's the official joint governing body, but the tribes have the ability to, um, implement who is actually the, the official joint governing body. So this would kind of force um, some uh, uh, negotiation, not negotiation, but it would force the state to, uh, if, if, if a situation should arise and somebody asks the state who is, uh, you know, who's the official joint governing body, then the state would have to um, talk to the tribes to find out who that person is. And you're most likely going to talk to the business councils. That's how I think it should work. So I think just adding the word official in there um, would kind of clear things up. Thank you for your um, questions for Councilman Ute. Uh, Senator Case. I think that's maybe some better thinking than what I was thinking before. Um, it, you know, so thank you. Can I ask if that solved that? 
I think it does. Committee members, maybe this is a good time to ask it. You know, we adopted this language in the other bill. I think it would be a conforming amendment to Absolutely. that bill draft that we just passed to make yeah. it match this. So I yeah. think that's yes. um, that's our intent, at least. Thank you. Okay. And then I had uh, one other. Okay. Um, and this might just need uh, clarification, but on the page one, uh, e line 11, it makes lines 10 and 11, it makes a reference to repealing the obsolete Wyoming Indian Affairs Council. However, it does not mention this, this uh, Wyoming Indian Affairs Council anywhere else in this legislation. So I think maybe, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's just kind of in there, but there's no other reference to where it comes from or you know what happened to it. Yeah. 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 And so Councilman, we do that in section two, of course. Councilman, okay. you, yeah, on page 31, section two, those are, those are the repealers and you always have to go read them. And sometimes we miss those. So, but that's the reference to them right there. It's just not named. Okay. That, Thank you. Fine. Good that, catch. And, this is and a, it is the art of reading those bills. That's an easy one to yeah. miss. No, yeah, that, that one came from our legal team. So I think maybe she just kind of missed that. And this, um, I got it. This is the kind of scrutiny we were asking for because we don't want to goof and make an unintended change. So thank you for that close look at that bill. Is there, okay. Was there anything else in there? That other you than that, Councilman? I think the, the Shoshone Business Council is fine with the, uh, you know, other than clerical errors and grammatical errors, word formations, things like that. I think we're fine with it. And then Councilman, you, um, maybe a, a question on this uh, tribal clerk piece of it. Did you happen to follow and track that concern? A little bit, yeah. Um, I'm trying to find the page, but I'd be curious to know your thoughts on that. Um, I think it's on the bottom of page 23 going on to 24. 24. Maybe while we're buying him a little time to find it, um, tribal clerk is also mentioned in a different part of the statute. It's in the same election definitions. Maybe Heather, you could look. It's Romanet uh, 28 XXVIII also uses the same term. I have reached out to our county clerk here in Fremont County um, to see if they actually use this statute or if, it, um, and I have some communication from her as well. So I could share at the appropriate time, but I didn't mean to take away from Councilman. Councilman, yeah. I, I think, uh, I, and I, and I, Chairman, I think the discussion was about if you were trying to designate uh, for both tribes or one. Is that what the is that what the question was? Correct. Okay, I think how it's worded is fine um, because the tribes might, at their discretion, decide to do one official for both tribes. Uh, but this, it, the way that I'm reading it, is the Eastern Shoshone tribe, at their choosing, can do it, or the Northern Arapaho tribe can do it at their choosing or both tribes can do it um, together, which might be a, a little more efficient of a process for them should they choose to do so. Okay, thank you. Further questions for Councilman, uh, Representative Clifford? I just wanted to, to echo and um, each tribe has their distinct designated tribal clerk, as well as the inner tribal council has a distinct tribal clerk. Is that correct? Councilman you? Yes. Okay, so this covers it. So, yeah. Madam Chairman? Mr. Co-Chair. So, Representative Clifford brings up something and, and I, I'd appreciate somebody could clarify this because you don't need state statutes to tell you how to do your tribal clerks. That's, your, tri that's your tribal government. I was under the impression that this applied to an official election clerk. Now, am I reading that wrong or tell me? I have I, a... I, I, I might be able to help. Senator Case. So um, this took a little while for me to sink in, but this, this defines in state statute something called a tribal clerk that is someone that is comes about through a cooperative agreement with the county clerk that, as to be the election contact person. Yeah. And so if a cooperative agreement exists between the Fremont County clerk and um, one of these entities, then there's something that the state in law would refer to as a tribal clerk. Yeah. That doesn't change, it, it's awkward to me. It seems awkward that it's presumptuous. Um, I did talk, I've, I've been texting uh, Julie Freese and she says that they have a cooperative agreement with the Northern Arapaho tribe, um, but they don't have one with the Eastern Shoshone tribe. Um, and that they, 
they use it somewhat, but um, it's odd to me, and I think Heather's got some input on this, but it's odd that, that something gets called in law a tribal clerk, which is very presumptuous. This is the tribal clerk, mm -hmm. just because of they are in a cooperative agreement with the county clerk, which is a state subdivision. So I'm wondering, um, you change that name. I'm just wondering, and maybe it goes beyond the bill, but it's like um, election contact person or something. Heather, I'm in a hole, dig me out. Madam Chairwoman, uh, Ms. Jarvis, Madam Chairwoman, uh, Senator Case and committee. The term tribal clerk, this is not trying to supplant uh, tribal law in any way. It, the term tribal, tribal clerk appears in all of Wyoming statutes two times, and it's in these definitions for the election. And the only, it, the um, tribal clerk is defined as someone who, uh, maybe if this committee says from either tribe or the joint, but then it's in the list, it's in the definition for a registry agent. Now in election law, a registry agent is, is a county clerk, his deputies, a tribal clerk, his deputies, a city clerk, his deputies, and an election judge during an election. Uh, as, as, and the, the function that a registry agent serves um, it is what a registry agent does. And that, that term is used through uh, in the election statutes some several times, but that's to to sign election proceeds and do things. So this is it's it's only used to say, hey, a registry agent could be one of these people from you know a city or a, a tribe or whatever who's going to then give some returns or be part of the elections in that way. So that that's what this is clarifying. Representative Clifford, thank you. I I really appreciate this um, robust conversation because um, I'm glad you clarified it, um, Madam Chair and Senator Case. So we have duly elected, um, well, no, we have appointed, I know for, I only could speak for my tribe, I don't know. And I know there's an election for election judges. So I understand now and I wanna get this right. So, um, you know, for Chairman Dresser, Councilman Ute, is it safe to say we, we need, I would like you to share our election judge process. So you, the tribe or Arapaho tribe appoints, you have the authority to appoint our election judges. And then they're confirmed by our general counsel this is the way that the, our, our, our resolution is written. You guys have a duly elected tribal wide election and you elect your election judges, correct? Yes. Okay, if you could share, please. Okay, uh, welcome Chairman Dresser. How about we have um, Councilman Ute um, offer some remarks on that question and then uh, Chairman Dresser. And then after that, if you wanna offer remarks on the bill, we can take those too. Uh, Chairman and committee, I believe the, well, it looks to me like the devil's in the details. So I think the, it's the, the nomenclature is getting confusing and it does, it does feel like you're, uh, I, I mean, it doesn't feel, it's sound, it could sound possibly that you're trying to delve into, uh, What's a tribal position, and um, and just as you stated, the, the the Eastern Shoshone does not have that position filled through the county. Now, maybe it does need to be changed into you know tribal clerk. clerk is referenced to uh, maybe maybe change it to tribal relations. If you use words wording like that, then it becomes less confusing because um, now you're you have a clear definition of what this position is and not what it is not. I think what it is not is a tribally appointed or elected position. It's something that comes from either the county or the state. Um, but, but by saying tribal clerk, it, it does become confusing. Uh, I think with this particular piece of legislation, uh, that section there, it, it, to me at least, is, is fairly well enough defined so that the tribes can figure out what it, what it means and what it doesn't mean. Welcome. Thank you, Councilman Yu. Chairman Dresser. Um, thank you, Madam um, Chairman, um, and also the rest of the committee members. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree, you know, and I, I'm, I'm grateful for this bill and just the fact that we're kind of cleaning it up and, and making it shaping up to be good. But also to, just to clarify that part too, because in our resolutions, how it reads, um, it's read as an election judge. And it, because basically they appoint one to each committee, I mean, to each community. So those, there's one in Arapaho, one in Ethiti, and one in Prowashki. But also in the language in there, it says there's a clerk. 
appointed to each place. So I, you know, I think that could kind of get a little confusing because it's stated in, a, in the resolutions itself. Resolution 6663. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have any other comments about the bill as we're working it or was this the, the only piece you wanted to comment, um, Chairman? Once again, um, Madam Chairwoman, um, thank you. Um, we've already, our attorney has overlooked it and has been communicating with Representative Clifford and we're, we're okay with the changes. Thank you so much. Questions, Chairman Kay, or Senator Case? Well, Madam Chairwoman, I wanna throw something out for people to think about that might accomplish everything. Um, Romanet 28 in the same section says a registry agent, and Heather just referred to that, is a county clerk, his deputies, a tribal clerk, his deputies, city clerk, on and on. I'm wondering, and I don't know if it can be really, I'm wondering if we change the words a tribal clerk to a tribal registry agent in that piece. And then when we come down to here, we say tribal registry agent means an official designated by the e And so it gets around the big words about the clerk. And I'm, I offer it hesitantly and maybe Heather could react to maybe what that might accomplish. Ms. Jarvis. Madam Chairwoman, committee, Senator Case. It appears as though that might alleviate any confusion with, with the term tribal clerk. It does not necessarily um, alleviate the, the question of whether a tribal registry agent or tribal, you know, if one of these entities would ever be appointed by the um, cooperative governing body or if these entities would only ever be an Eastern Shoshone one or a Northern Arapaho person? Would, would there ever be, so, so that doesn't answer the question that is on page 24 of whether there ought to be the reference to an official designated by the cooperative tribal governing body because maybe that should come out because it would never happen. Or, so it doesn't answer that question, but I think it would alleviate the clerk confusion that has been created. <laughs> Mr. Co-Chair. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I think the, the language in 24 just allows for the possibility, should that be taken by the tribes, if they wanted to have a joint tribal one. I, Senator Case, I really like that language because it, it was confusing to me. And I'm sitting there scratching my head, why are we in state statute determine what the tribal clerks are? And, and I think that that would, um, that would certainly clean that up and refer back to the purpose of that being used as a registered agent for the county clerk in regards to the election process. So I, I would hope. Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Again, a good discussion. Um, and I see where you're going and I understand your point, but I need to push back. So Councilman Yu is okay with this current language. Chairman Dresser is okay with tribal clerk. Am I understanding that correctly? I, I need clarification on that. So Councilman Yu, are you okay with tribal clerk? Did I, did I understand that right? You are okay with tri the, tri the term tribal clerk? Councilman? Uh, Representative Clifford, I, I believe it's clear enough as, as is. Um, I understand the clarification could possibly be, but it also might bring up a few more issues along the way. I think as is, I think it's fine. Okay. Chairman Dresser? Yes. You think it's clear as it is? Yes, Madam okay. Chairwoman. Follow up, Representative Clifford? Thank you, follow up. Um, Chairman Dresser, in our resolution 6663, which is our Northern Arapaho Tribal Election Code, yes. we officially designate our so-called uh, tribal clerk, which happens to be the tribal secretary, right? She takes minutes of the election judges and records all of that, right? And she reports to you, so she's, she has a definite role, right? Yes, yes she does. Okay, so, that, so I just need to share that too with y'all. And I think, uh, Madam Chairman, I think it's leave it be because it, in the end, it gives these guys flexibility. They're the duly elected officials and it, and it gives flexibility. And I think that they're okay with it. And I understand Senator Case's concern. I really do, Senator. But again, it's sovereign tribes and you're okay with that definition. It doesn't mean we need to conform with a state tribal registry agent because we don't have that. It's not in our election codes. 
It's just not. But we understand what that means. Okay, thank you. Gentlemen, I, I'm gonna throw one more out there for you. And I think that we need the word and Heather on the bottom of page 23. Because the way I read this, it says the Eastern Shoshone tribe, the Northern Arapaho tribe, or from the inner tribal. So that means you get a pick from one of those as the tribal clerk. So I think our intent is designated by the Eastern Shoshone and an official designated by the Northern Arapaho tribe. And then it'll say, or an official designated by both tribes. Is that, that's the intent. That way it's, we're not picking from one. We're either saying you each get your own or there's one. No, the and makes it have to be from Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho. This is where the Oxford comma is an awesome thing. If we put, but I don't know, Heather, so help me out there. Madam Chairwoman, Mr. Chairman, it, the, this language reproduces the, the two words official. So an official designated by the Eastern Shoshone tribe would be one and an official. So that's, a, a, I, I believe that your concern, Mr. Chairman, is not necessary to be a concern because there's an official here, an official there, or an official by both from okay. who's appointed by both. So it, 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 it would not mean what you said, one official who has to be by both if they didn't want it to be by both. Right. I, oh, Madam Chair, that's how I understood it as well. Okay, I think we missed that word. Any other comments, questions from committee members? Um, Madam Chairwoman, I just have a communication from the county clerk, um, Julie Freese, and she just said, wants me to say, could you explain that we allow anyone, the tribes decide they want to designate to be this person? And so, I mean, that's the spirit that the county clerk has about this. Um, so, uh, um, so okay. I think that's, that's good. I, I'm fine with the way it goes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you for that. And I, I, that's was going to be my comment is, in my working relationship with our county attorney, she she looks to these guys, and there's no concern with her taking it someplace else. She she listens to what the tribally elected leaders of both tribes uh, tell her, and who they direct who to work with her. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for our council members? Thank you so much. This was helpful. Thank you. I think we do want to get right because Miss Freeze is a very competent clerk. There's no doubt about it. But and someday, she's listening right now. Someday she will not be there. <laughs> if she's listening, we would just say she is the clerk. <laughs> someday she may not be there. So um, we want to get it right for future clerks. Any other comments from the public? Seeing none, public comment is closed. Committee, Move which your pleasure. It's been moved by Larson, seconded by Clifford. Amendment. Let's um, start working the bill page by page. Any comments on page one, page two, page three? Um, Representative Clifford? Yes. Propose an amendment on page three, Madam Chairman, and on lines 12 adding the word official. So it would read that line 12, Eastern Shoshone, Northern Arapahoe tribes or its official successor joint governing body, Second. period. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The amendment's passed. Any other amendments on page three? Seeing none, let's look at page four. Madam Chairman. Senator Representative Larson. Madam Chairman, on the bottom of page four, the reference to 912805, and on page five, the reference to 912902 would then be captured in subsection two, or however Heather puts that to say that if the other bill passes, these bill this these do not apply, however you do them. So I think the motion is to include repealer contingent repealer language in the bill, but these two sections would be repealed if the other bill passes. Madam Chairman, uh, Chairwoman, uh, Mr. Chairman, also the third section uh, on line seven, correct? Uh, Which is subsection H? Yes, yes, thank you. So all three sections? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that's lines seven through 23 on page four onto page five, lines one through 10, we would add a different language in probably a different part of the bill, clarifying that those would be repealed if the other bill passes. All those in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say no, the amendment's passed. 
Moving on to page five, are there any additional amendments? Madam Chair. Representative Back Clifford. Page four, please. Page four, okay. uh, line 19 and 20. Um, deleting Eastern Shoshone and deleting the Indian because in the federal registry is Eastern Shoshone tribe and the Northern Arapaho tribe. Okay. The okay. federal registry. So that's deleting Indian. Okay. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The amendment's passed. Back to page five. Page six. Yes. Madam Chair. Representative Clifford. Uh, oh, again, the same amendment, uh, page six, line one, uh, deleting the word Indian. And well, actually it would be page five, bottom of page five, there on line 23, deleting Indian. And then on to uh, page six, line one, deleting North, the, the word Indian. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there a second? The discussion. Or it's been seconded, is that correct? Second. Uh, Blackburn seconded. Mr. Co-Chair? Discussion. So if that, could we just in the same amendment and do that throughout the statute? Where, where it's applicable and not do an amendment for each one, but just say, where is, do you know, are there more yeah, places? Yeah, there's more places. And so, uh, Madam Chairman, at your discretion, I have them all outlined here. Do you just want to give me uh, to uh, how about Heather? Heather? Uh, let's make the motion. Let's outline them all, and we'll just follow you and track along that way. I think that'll okay. be fastest. Okay. So let's point them out. Make sure we get them. Go ahead and just we'll do it now. And all right. Cool. So deleting all the the Indian in there is also going to be page ten, line nineteen. And and it might include the other lines. Sorry. Um, eighteen. Yep. Eighteen and nineteen. Page 11, lines um, 13 and 14, as well as line 21, um, 21 or 20 or 19 and yeah, let's see. Yep, 19 and 21. Page 12, lines two and three. Page 20, lines 15 and 16, um, yep, 15 and 16, um, and yep, that's it for, oh wait, page 28, <laughs> page 28, lines 13 and 14, page 29, lines 12 and 13. Hold on, let's just make sure, Heather, are you tracking yep. all these? Maybe slow down just a smidge. And I could give this to her, Chairman. Yep, I was on 20 and then you said 28. Yep, 28 lines 13 and 14. Okay. Good, Heather. Yep, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, page 29, lines 12 and 13. Page 30, lines three and four, and lines 21 and 22. Okay. It's been moved. I believe it's second. It, it's and seconded. So, Madam, Madam Chairman, on on thirty, it's just in line twenty-two, isn't it? I believe so. It, thanks. Yeah. Any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none. All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. <clears throat> the amendment's passed. We were back on page. Madam, Madam Chairman, oh, Miss Jarvis. I am unclear if a part of that amendment is if there are any other places in the statutes that have the word Indian. Um, I mean, that might not be in this bill, for example. If, if that was that a part of it, or we were just doing these here for the bill. Okay. okay. Just for this bill, Heather. Okay. So we we're on page seven. Page um, six. Page six. My apologies. Page six amendment. Okay. Uh, Representative Blackburn. Line 17. Northern Arapaho, Eastern Shoshone. And to, change that. Okay. Swap. And also on. So let's go through all those times we want to swap and make sure. Page and if, 30. If then. LSO catches other instances to make that correction, but let's go through them just so we can give her some guidance so we, we don't, to help her out and help us all out. Where only, else do you see it, Representative Blackburn? The only two I have is page six and then page 30. Page line six. 21, 21 and 22. 30. Okay, it's been moved. 21, 22. Moved and seconded. Is there any other um, any other areas where you see the the swap being necessary, Representative Clifford? I would like to add page twenty five, line four, and swap that. Yep. It is in 
uh, reference to the language, but put Eastern Shoshone first, then Northern Arapaho yeah, followed. We just said that's a kind yep. of we did that. Oh, you did do that? Okay. So. Any other instances? Uh, um, can any? we have leeway in the motion that if there are other instances, we fix them? Yes. Representative Blackburn, is that your intent? Yes, okay. Chairman. Any other um, discussion on the amendments? Seeing none, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The amendment's passed. So we're, we were on page six. We're going to, any other amendments on six? Anything on seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14? Oh, Representative Clifford? Starting on uh, page 14. This is going to address, I know if you don't mind, I'll just read them through, but it's the word indigenous, and we were wanting to capitalize that. That's my motion. So I, I have them all identified. So it's from page 14 to, to page 23. Does that need to be capitalized? I, I, yep, I was talking to my tribal representatives, and just like the word Indian and the word tribe capitalized, they want the in, word indigenous capitalized. Um, Ms. Jarvis, did you have a comment? Madam Chairwoman, I just wanted to know what page we're on. Uh, page 14. Line six through seven, Madam Chairman. Okay, it's been moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, uh, Ms. Jarvis? Madam Chairwoman, uh, typically, it's uh, typically in, in the statutes, and, and you, you all are quite probably familiar that, um, like, uh, many things that if we were writing a nice essay or something, we, we would capitalize and that, that the statutes don't necessarily. So this most likely, although it can be um, the intent, but it would uh, go against the kind of the um, construction conventions, like on page 14, for example, um, where th that would not typically be a word in it and just like regular statutory construction for Wyoming statutes that we would, um, that would not be capitalized just to be consistent with other things that are not capitalized. For example, um, right at this moment, I can't think of a single thing. State. <laughs> state the state the, the of state. Wyoming is not capitalized. Um, uh, and you know, there, there, are, there are only a very few things that like actually are capitalized, like Wyoming is, um, well, Eastern and Shoshone are capitalized. Um, that, and and e even like the name of um, Wyoming Business Council, for example, Why, uh, if we were writing that in a, in a essay, we would capitalize Wyoming Business and Council, but in the statutes, it shows up as capital y W Wyoming, but then Business Council, lower, lower. So it, it just would not, it would go against the conventions um, to do that particular capitalization, and that's just food for thought for the committee. Okay, discussion on the amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, opposed, please say no. No. The amendments failed. On to page 15. 16, 17, I have one on page 17. On line two, insert the word each before the word individual. And then on line nine, insert the word each before the word individual. And if you look at the, if you go back to page 15, um, the term, you know, we, we talk about both the, the business councils of Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho tribes or the cooperative tribal governing body. So I think it's, it's laid out that that's who we're talking about, but we have each um, on line 14. Yeah. And so I think just making sure that we either use each in all of the lines or, um, and just make that a conforming. Second. That's the amendment. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Okay, any other comments? 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, oh, 23, on line, page 23, line 23, reinsert the stricken and. That's, I move to reinsert the stricken and. Is there a second? Second. Um, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. So this would make it clear that we're either talking about someone designated from Eastern Shoshone and someone designated from Northern Arapaho or someone designated by the cooperative tribal governing body. Any discussion? 
Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. Let's try that again. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The amendment's passed. Aye, aye, aye. Page 24, page 25, page 26, page 27. Representative Clifford? Nothing, no. Oh. Um, Mr. Co-Chair? Madam Chairman, I think we were, um, we had a discussion there about amending the definite uh, that we would, that was we gonna do it in this bill where we would add in the definitions to this uh, section 300, um, finding what reservation is, is that right? <laughs> We could certainly do that, Mr. Co-Chair. Would you like to make that motion? I'd make that motion. Okay, it's a conceptual motion and it would require LSO to make a clarifying um, definition that when we refer to the, that the Wind River Reservation also includes what was formerly known as the Shoshone Indian Reservation. That's the motion. Um, second, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Senator Case? Um, I think that sounds good. I wonder if anybody in the audience it's you know, it's kind of of some significance, might want to weigh in on that. Yeah. And I'm good with it, but. Okay. Um, you know, once we get the, the bill draft, we'll, we'll make sure we recirculate this. And if we need to adjust it come session, I think we can do that. Mr. Co-Chair, you certainly have my commitment. Um, Ms. Jarvis. Madam Chairwoman, another um, option so that there doesn't become some sort of definitional challenge. Um, could be that the reference could be square mile in the northeast portion of the historical Wind River Indian Reservation. And so the, the fix different from the rest of the bill where we were making everything be Wind River Indian Reservation, but could just simply refer to historical Shoshone Indian Reservation since these are historical um, Bighorn Hot Springs and, and the parks and, and things like that. That could be, um, if, if there's no problem with it circulating another version, on the other hand, this, there, something like this might be if the committee wants to be certain of what goes in there as, as another possibility. It feels good. Senator Case, um, yeah. Co-Chairman Larson. She lost me. Sorry, Ms. so Jarvis. for example, on page 27, if it would, uh, I'm just looking at 36.8-302, but there are four sections that deal with this in Title 36. Um, these are talking about from and after the passage of this act, the land manages part um, of a date of the northern portion of the historic it's weird. It's Wind River. Historic, historic Shoshone Indian Reservation, leaving the word Shoshone because that was it as part of the Okay, that's grant. even better. I, um, Miss, Miss, Madam Chairman. Mr. Co-Chair, or I'm, Senator Case. Not anymore, but th thank you. Um, there's one piece of our statutes, they're, they're kind of a tapestry of history, you know, and sometimes it's important. Um, mm -hmm. um, so this might be one of those pieces where we wanna preserve that history, but realize that we're not saying it's a Shoshone reservation now. Um, and we, historic Shoshone reservation is fine. Uh, historically termed Shoshone Reservation is fine. Um, I don't want to stir it up bad, but did you know that Sinks Canyon used to be part of the historic Shoshone Reservation? Just throwing that out there to get a smile. Okay, Senator, or Mr. Co-Chairman. So the way I understood it is we would not, in in that section, we would maybe say historic Shoshone, Shoshone Indian Reservation and not have Wind River Reservation. And I'm fine with that. I, I, if that's would be a friendly amendment if everybody's doing that. Um, yep. Yeah, same on in both places. You so good with that in? That's the amendment then would be okay. to in these sections dealing with um, this language referring to it as the historic Shoshone Indian Reservation on page 26 and 27. And that's it, right? The three areas. Yeah, well, and we might. Well, no, because we're, uh -oh, we're yeah, done. We're, uh -oh. And I, I guess let's look out, Madam Chairman, let's look out into the audience and see if they're just kind of shaking their heads here, if, if, if you're okay with that. My, your Councilman, you. Okay. 
Okay, we are. We are okay, right. So that's the motion. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, questions been called. All those in favor um, of the motion, uh, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say no. The amendments passed. Any more amendments? 26, page 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. And 31, just as again, it would have a new contingency language about repealing the business council language if the other bill passes. Okay. Any further discussion on the bill? Question. Questions called? We'll do a roll call vote, please. This is a roll call vote on bill draft 22 LSO 0110 version six as amended. Senator Case. Aye. Senator Salazar. Aye. Representative Blackburn. Aye. Representative Clifford. Aye. Chairman Ellis. Aye. Co-Chairman Larson. Aye. We have six ayes, Madam Chair. Okay. Madam Chairman. Mr. Co-Chair. Heather, if it's all right with uh, Chairman Ellis, we'll take the BRC bill and this bill as House bill. Okay. And then they'll do that. So you've got this bill, Chair <laughs> Sandy. Um, Madam Chairwoman, um, may I make an introduction of someone if we get a chance? Senator Case, absolutely. So everybody, I can see an old colleague, no, a former colleague, um, Mr. Mark O'Harris, who served in the Senate, Wyoming Senate, uh, lives in my district. And I want to also point out that he was one of the founding members, along with myself, of the Select Committee on Tribal Relations. We both started in 2001. So we've been on this, I've been on this committee for 20 years. And uh, Senator Harris uh, uh, was one of the original folks with Harry Tipton and Bob Peck. And I'm trying to remember who else was on that committee. I'm, I'm missing one person. But anyway, it's really good to see you. Uh, uh, I, I keep track of, of uh, Senator Harris and, and uh, he lets me know things and it's just great to see him, him here. Welcome. Good to see you, Mike. Did you want to make any comments? And certainly we stand on tall sh shoulders. Thank you, welcome back. That was a, a it was used to be Senate humor, Madam Chairman, that um, Senator Harris sat in the seat where I sit, and I wanted that seat so badly, but he used to get up, and, and his, the joke was, um, Senator Kennison would always say, stand up, stand up, stand up, and he'd go, I am standing, and it was just about his stature, but not his stature. All righty, everybody, we're ahead on our schedule. Um, how about we take a 10 minute break? We'll come back at 1120. We have Mr. Tyndall um, from CWC with us. I see him in the audience. So I think we'll come back and we're a little ahead of schedule, but that's that's not a problem. Um, and we'll try and coordinate to see if we can have Mr. Seidel, Ms. Caldwell and others from the community colleges speak. Uh, Mr. Tyndall. Okay, so we'll take a break and then we'll move on to community colleges and hopefully we can finish a little early today and get people on the road, particularly our LSO staff at home safe. We'll be back in 10 minutes.
everything settled, please? Right. Um, good morning, Chairwoman um, Ellis and um, committee members. I am Brad Tyndall, president of Central Wyoming College, and I have several of our um, my colleagues here with us. If they would introduce themselves, maybe we go Ivan first. I'm Ivan Posey, the um, tribal education coordinator for the college, and good to see you guys. And Rory Tindor. Madam Chairwoman. Chairwoman, my name is Rory Tindor. I'm the Native American Student Coordinator for Central Wyoming College. To my left, Dr. Mark Nardine. I'm Mark Nardine. I'm the Dean of the Arts and Sciences Division. Sorry. <laughs> Lisa. Lisa Applehans. Madam Chairwoman Ellis, I am Lisa Applehans. I'm the Coordinator for CWC Wind River. Applehans. A P P E L H A N S. Apple hands, but there are no D in hands. No. All right. All right. So we have a PowerPoint presentation that we'll go through quickly. I don't want to have death by PowerPoint, but there's a few, a few um, points I'd like to, to to pull up. And what you'll see when it comes up is, I've borrowed different slides from different presentations, which basically speak to the word there is partnership and good medicine and good relations. And given that this is the um, tribal relations um, legislative committee, I hope you'd appreciate that, that a lot of what we try to do is not only education, but kind of build good relationships. And so um, if we go to the next slide, this slide is actually um, from a presentation that Mr. Posey gives on called Wind River 101 training. And, and, and we typically start with gratitude. And so I, my piece of gratitude today is explaining my, my beautiful tie. This is a gift. Obviously, it's um, Eastern Shoshone because of the rose. It was given to me by um, uh, Mr. Posey. And, it's, and uh, I proudly wear this. And I, I like to explain to some people that I'm not trained to appropriate culture, but I recognize that I, as a symbol of the college who's heart is the Wind River Indian Reservation that it's important to represent, even though I myself am not um, American Indian. But I do think when I go to certain meetings, whether it's a commission meeting or elsewhere, it's good for folks to remember, yes, we have the Wind River Rev Reservation um, in our state. And I am grateful for this gift. I also, in terms of a, just a point of gratitude, who could not be with us today is Dr. Um, Teresa Spoonhunter, who is the head of our academics under uh, Dean Mark Nordine's leadership. And uh, the Spoon Hunter family, I'm very grateful for, for they had been a great support during my past trials with cancer last year, and now I, I'm good. But I think there's a lot to be grateful for. And, and this framework of this slide um, comes from the Americans for Indian Opportunities. And I bring this up because as you approach relationships among peoples, respecting sovereignties, you, you, you need a philosophical approach whether you recognize that or not. You, you're acting with an approach even if you don't think you have one. So the articulated approach that we take as a college is very much something from the Americans for Indian Opportunities whom Mr. Posey brought from experience in the past to our campus for, for getting wisdom and advice. And the approach that we take is one that is, it's not um, blame or victimization, but really appreciation. So if you look at the histories of treaties and tribes, you're gonna to try to build relationships and good neighbors, it's a good place to have that philosophical approach. It's not like blaming or finger pointing, but from the sense of true appreciation. And that's why I wanted to start off with the appreciation of the tie. It's very much in our philosophy that we believe that by having being good neighbors and having good relations and respecting one another's sovereignties and wishes, we all can advance together 
And our college has taken the approach that we believe that as the reservation rises, all ships rise. And I think that's true for our Wyoming. And I think um, I'm impressed, Senator Case, that this has been going on for 20 years. And I really think that, that it was a beautiful thing to have a tribal relations committee because relationships are so critical for us to move forward. So, so much of Mr. Posey's job is working on that relationship piece, as you'll see. So moving right along to the next slide, please. We basically, it's, it's, it's good to think of a college in terms of three broad things that we do. On the left there, we see college credit and research. And so we have a, a Native American Indigenous Studies program at the two-year level, and now at the four-year level, where there's this tribal leadership option. And so much represented that area is really leadership development. For, as we even heard with any of the legislation, if you don't have good leadership, and visions for the future, then economic development, I would argue, can't even happen. So having well-educated people um, who understand systems, whether it be natural resources or complex law or history is so critical. So I think that's kind of a fundamental um, tier of this three-legged um, stool, if you will. Down at the bottom is student support. We, you'll hear some information where you'll see that student success is a challenge. With, not all, with all students at Central Wyoming College, but also in particular with our uh, American Indian students. So student support is critical. And so one of the, the two leads on that would be Rory Tindor is part of what we'll, I'll explain what the Nisanti is and, and Miss Applehands here. Um, the third tier is this non-credit and outreach. That is that relationship piece. It's one thing to teach classes and do student support, but if we ignore that whole outreach, working with two sovereign tribes, establishing MOUs, having understanding, I think this is sunk. You, you can't ignore the relationship piece. And I'm grateful for the work of Ivan Posey. You see in the right hand corner, there's Wyoming PBS. As we know, they do a lot of great work. They are not sent to Wyoming College, although we are their host location, but we do a lot of things in partnership with them. And the foundation mentioned at the next, so next slide, please. All right, I'm not gonna go through every piece of this here, but you can see that there's a whole variety of things that we do academically, and you see that we do research. And if you're astute, you will notice that the research pieces always are in partnership with the University of Wyoming. University of Wyoming, I have nothing but praise for the work that they do. And when we do things um, on the reservation and with the reservation, very typically it's in partnership with the University of Wyoming and they're after us. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of our credit programs, we have established um, in the last couple of years, CWC Wind River. We had CWC Lander, CWC Dubois, CWC Jackson. And a wise person said to me, why don't we have CWC Wind River? And I go, ooh, that's a hard to uh, uh, refute. And so we now we do formally, informally, we offered classes in ETHID in Fort Washington before, but now it's a formal uh, MOU. It's actually a revenue and cost sharing operation. And the reason why it was set it that way, it re uh, recognizes the sovereignty of the tribes. And so they're a complete partner, not someone just hosting an institution, but being a partner in that institution and suffering together and rising together with this cost and revenue sharing agreements. We also, one program that we have, the Alpine Science Institute, has been heavily um, um, participated by our um, American Indian students. And once again, largely through funding and support from the University of Wyoming, we take students to Mount Kilimanjaro, Gannett Peak, uh, riding bikes across the nation, and other great experiential leadership development and scientific activities. Uh, next slide, please. So that's just a, a sample of a student who uh, we had two different students who were the their first for their for their nations to mount uh, significant mountains, and there's a lot of great stories we could tell. But this is just a quick little slide. Next, next slide, please. Economic development, um, also again in partnership with the University of Wyoming, we had the Wind River Indian Reservation Startup Challenge, and I believe they're they're looking at another one. And through working with UW, we had Dr. Trissa Spoonhunter and Kyle Trumbull work on that project that allocated funds for business startup. 
Uh, we independently also do some work under Lynn McCullough for entrepreneurship development. So that's just, uh, and that came from, it says, uh, our, our path, um, um, Pathfinder newsletter. So we have newsletters and other outreach things. Next slide, please. All right, so I mentioned Mr. Ivan Posey and the Institute of Tribal Learning, how we base so much of what we do on philosophically from the Americans for Indian Opportunities Group. They had a training called Indian 101, and we basically made our own Wind River 101, and we start that training internally, and we have already had outside audiences who want to have this training. It's very positive, but it's historically real. We're not denying history, but with the right philosophy of non-blaming, non-victimization, you can look at things in good spirit, learn from them, and move forward. Um, we anticipate that that will be um, brought beyond the walls of the college very soon as other organizations, realtors, uh, chambers of commerce, and others are saying um, they want this training. Mr. Posey did do that training already for, I believe it was the Chamber of Commerce in Jackson, because they had kind of a fiasco during one of their parades of inappropriate um, garb and behavior. And so we did a training for them. Uh, other things to point out, a lot of outreach activities, newsletters, podcasts, speaker series, powwows. Uh, that's probably, we have a, an advisory committee and there's a lot of people I need to thank. And so in addition to the people up here, I want to point out that on our advisory committee are several members from the audience, including, um, I don't know if they're all here for UW, but UW is a member of our advisory committee as well for service to the reservation. I have Luis Anker Storm with here um, from Institutional Research. We have um, Beth Montero from the foundation. I see probably others. Uh, Scotty Ratliff, the president whisperer is in the audience and, and a, an important member of our advisory committee. And I'm sure there's others if I look around carefully and I know there are. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of student support, what is, has been huge for us and for the state of Wyoming is that we have a, um, a minority serving institution. Until the state, the state has not had an institution of higher learning that was minority serving, let alone Native American serving. So we work to get that designation and it does avail more support funds for the wraparound services um, that we see from both Ms. Tendor and Applehands and others. Um, and we also, of course, use our TRIO student support funds for, funds for um, student support. Next slide, please. Okay, I don't want to go into this huge detail, but um, maybe it's worth pointing out a few things. About half of the American Indian students attending Wyoming Community Colleges come to CWC. That's natural, that's to be expected. Um, at CWC, about 14% of our student body are American Indian. That number's a little tricky to get because nowadays people don't have to self-identify very well. And so you have to do a little bit of guessing. My guess is that number's a little bit higher. Um, we'll see at some of those bullets that the student success rate for our American Indian students is a little bit less than our regular, the other or the collective student body rather. And so that, that continues to be a challenge, but we are making inroads. So that uh, the second bullet from the bottom, despite many improvements, American Indian students lag behind on most measures of student success. And this gives you a sense of how much it is. On average, 7% of CWC students withdraw from their courses, while 16% of our American Indian students. But having said that, we've started this leadership program. And next slide, please. Um, you can see those two bottom bullets the gap between white and minority student success rates drop. So we're narrowing the gap. We are making progress from a 25% gap in 2015 to a 12% gap in 2019. And that's a huge increase, right? We cut the gap in half. And that last bullet, 15% of our graduates in 2019 were Native American, which is a higher percentage than the percentage of Native Americans in our student body, and the number of those in honors has grown and doubled. So things are moving in the right direction. You definitely see cohorts of future leaders forming and coming from the reservation, and we're partnering with those. Uh, 
I do want to reckon, uh, point out that um, we as a college do have a higher percentage of, of poverty we deal with. And it is not just a reservation. You know, all you do is drive around the county in parts of Riverton where you see there's mobile homes are rampant. And so these activities to support our American Indian friends support everybody. There's just poverty wears many um, colors. Um, and, and one of the things that we're most proud of, and I say this quite often, is that in orange there, CWC is in the 90th percentile for taking students from the lowest quintile, rags, to the highest quintile of income, riches. And so we, yes, a lot of people don't make it through the pipeline, but a lot of people do, and we make huge rags to riches changes in people's lives. This information is tracked through, I think it's people's social security numbers, maybe um, Luis Storm can explain that if you want those questions. Next slide, please. All right, so we show that in general, things are getting better in terms of number of graduates, blue, number of those in honors, orange, but the pandemic year hurt um, our reservation students the most, which makes sense. Um, if you just check the numbers of the impact on COVID, it has been devastating for our re uh, reservation friends and you see it in our numbers. And that is probably a contributing factor why we have our, our mask mandate. We, we protect all our students and, and uh, respect the, um, the perspective of the tribes on these matters. Next slide. All right, so we have support from our foundation, which is critical. The foundation I want to thank because of the Nasanti status that brought us the resources to do more. We have folks from the Presbyterian Church who've done scholarships and others, and I won't go into great detail, but part of our job is to muster the funds to support um, the tribes. And in doing so, we're cognizant of the fact that we're not using the tribes and using Native Americans or using Native American poverty in some way that empowers the college. The funds that we get for Native Americans, for Native American causes are used for that specific purpose, not to be some form of you know, usury kind of thing. And uh, next slide, I think we might be getting near the end here. Indeed, and so, um, Thank you for that time. I, uh, I have my colleagues here that can answer questions probably better than I can, but we stand for questions should you have any. Thank you. Thank you, President Tyndall. Questions for CWC, Representative uh, Larson? Thank you, and uh, thanks to all of you, President Tyndall. Thanks to you. CWC, of course, is a big deal to those of us who live here in Fremont County and appreciate uh, what you do for um, all students non-traditional and traditional in the outreach that you have into our high schools as well. Um, on, and I don't know which slide number this is, but it's the, the native student profile slide. Mm -hmm. It talked about 14% of uh, the student body identifies as American Indian. I just was wondering if that includes um, all students non-traditional and traditional in that number, or if that's just your traditional students? That's my first question. Mr. That's President. All, thank, thank you, Madam Chairman, um, Representative Larson, Co-Chair Larson. Yes, that's all students. And if, if I need to be corrected, one of you jump in and correct me, but yeah. So if you were to break that down um, of the total traditional students, okay, across, across all, what percentage of the traditional students do you think are Native American? Mr. Tyndall. Uh, Madam Chairwoman and Co-Chair Larson, I would need, uh, Louisa, can you answer that question? Do you want to come up? We can get to the information. Thank you. Can you follow up? Then, Madam Chairman, 69% uh, uh, continued on to the spring uh, of, of this year, which is, I think, I think is a substantial increase uh, in, in, in the step in the right direction. Yes. What do you normally see freshmen, what percentage of uh, traditional freshmen generally move over into the, 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 the next year after the end of the first year? Is it around that? Is it higher than that? Help me. One, Ms. Louisa. Daughter of George and Paula. 
And, and please identify yourself for the record. Yes, Thank you. My name is Louisa Hunkerstrom. I'm the director of institutional effectiveness here at CWC. So I'm the person who usually supplies these numbers. Um, the uh, fall to fall retention rate. So students who start one fall come back the next fall is usually around 50%. Um, so we see um, a bunch of students leave between the fall and the spring. And then again, between the spring and the subsequent fall. Um, but we don't break it down usually between just um, traditional age and non-traditional age, which I think was part of your question. Although, of course, we can find that out and send it to yeah. you. Follow up? So uh, I would assume we'd be very pleased then if we're at 69%. Louisa. It's consistently improved every year for yeah. the past five or so years. Probably then. Thank you. And then one follow up. And, and I just want to make sure I, I get a clarification, Madam Chairman, from President Tyndall, when he was talking about poverty and poverty around the county, you made a reference to mobile homes. Are you implying then that if you live in a mobile home that you're impoverished? President Tyndall? No, no uh, disparaging intent was there, but I just, I did want to point out, especially I hear this from my wife when I talk about poverty, she reminds me it's everywhere. And so- Thank you. I, so my apologies for just want to clear that up a little. Thank you for that. Madam. Additional comments, uh, Senator Case. Um, just a couple. So Lander shares poverty too. Um, it's a countywide. Yes, it truly is. Um, but also, uh, you, I appreciate the comments about the committee in twenty years. But sitting right next to you is the first uh, liaison that we ever had and he did a great job and, and really created that job. So uh, Mr. Posey deserves kudos in this whole process, which is unique to Wyoming and I'm really excited about it, but thank you. And you're doing a good job too. This is incredible. The, uh, the retention, the success improvements, those are astounding numbers. And uh, yeah, you know, I commend CWC, all your staff, uh, everybody that's been part of this. It's really amazing and a good thing. Um, Mr. Co-Chair. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'd also, uh, President Tindall, I think your BAS um, degree in tribal leadership, could you expound on that? Just give us a feel for how many students you have enrolled in that and, and as you've rolled that out, how you feel that's going. I think that really has great potential. President Tyndall. Um, Madam Chairman and um, Co-Chair Larson, I will, if Louisa can huddle up next to the mic, I will go and she can jump in. In general, um, I think that it started with um, great guns and then COVID hit. So I was thinking we had about was 30 something students, I think originally, but we had some attrition. I think we're somewhere around 15, but we anticipate um, after COVID, I may have to please, or the new normal, that things will, will do better. But um, I think that we, the COVID did take a hit to that program. Isn't that correct, Louisa? Just refreshing now. I will say um, our org organizational leadership and management bachelor's degree has several different program options. Tribal leadership is one of those options. Um, but the larger degree is one of the most popular majors amongst our American Indian students. We have a lot um, of them in that program seeking their bachelor's degrees. And I'll look, um, we have 81 students total in that program this fall. Um, eight of them are in the tribal leadership program. Yeah, and I'm sure that's pandemic related. Last year we had, uh, don't know that off the top of it my head. It was around 15 or yeah. so, I, as, as I recall. But so, I think just reiterating, there's a lot of students in the tribal leadership option, but in addition, those are just choosing the regular leadership option without the American Indian specialty. So it's popular, uh, especially in the total if you combine the, the tribal option versus the non-tribal option. Additional questions for CWC, Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chairman, I got a question. Um, could they expound on the tribal leadership? What kind of classes are you offering in that specific tribal leadership course? Mr. Nardine. Madam Chair and Representative Clifford, the, um, the, the option includes um, 
15, 16 credits, I believe, of, of topics specific to the Native American community. So tribal resources is a big part of that. Tri tribal government is a big part of that. Another part of that is also, um, oh, what is it? Uh, it has more to do with other governmental and uh, political sorts of things. So it's, it's really defined to be what, um, what Teresa Spoonhunter, Ivan was a part of this as well, had felt, and we also got tribal input on, from both tribes on that option as to what courses should be offered in specifically in that option. Now, there's still, so we, we think we have a pretty good one, I might say, but, um, but also there's all the business related types of courses and leadership courses and management courses that are part of the core of the BAS degree, which all these students take. And so when we were asked by uh, both tribes for a, uh, for training, for education, for future tribal council members, this is, this is what we came up with. And I, well, I'm pretty proud of it, can you tell? I think it's a pretty cool deal. So yes, thank you. Further questions? Uh, Senator Salazar, hello. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. President, can you, what about uh, tribal students in the nursing program? Is that, I, can you tell me something about that? And, and is that attractive? And just give me a general idea. I'll look to, I know in general, because I'm <laughs> flying high, but in terms of the exact numbers, yes, it, it is an important program because it's, you get a good job and it's one of the best programs we would argue certainly at the two-year level nationally. And we do have quite a number. I don't know the exact number, probably within two minutes, depending on how fast the Wi-Fi is, we can give you an answer. But I think it's fair to say that there is um, good representation in that program, percentage-wise, I would think, matching kind of the 14% average number or higher, I would think. Further questions? Representative Clifford? I just, uh, Madam Chair, Min, thank you. I just wanna thank you, Dr. Tyndall. You have some great tribal people there at the helm with Ivan and Rory and Dr. Swinunter, and you're, you're doing awesome, uh, doing great. And I just wanna echo that what you did with the Wind River Tribal College is just awesome. And you're changing generations and I see it. You are making an impact for future generations down the road. And so I just thank you for that. And I'm a proud alumni of CWC. Mm. I'll always support <laughs> CWC. Thank you. Yes. Right. Thank you, uh, President. I, I had one question too, and I, I'd like to hear about just recruitment and retention in general of um, how that's going, what you do. And I'm sure because of your relationship with the University of Wyoming, that's been a, a f part of their focus in more recent years. And so if you could just touch on um, some of your work, I'd be interested to know. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. A uh, majority of the work that we do, and to kind of elaborate a little bit more on um, Senator Salazar's question, we have three Northern Arapaho, very proud Northern Arapaho nursing students. And their motivation to attend for two of the female nursing students is that they have elders in their family that they wanna be able to protect. We know that we have funding that's coming available at a federal level to be able to allow the tribe to advocate in the best interest of their people. And we have these young people who wanna be a part of that movement. And they know in order to have an impact, they need to understand that system in order to play a part and to help with the leadership to make an informed decision in the best interest of these people, in the best interest of their elders. Um, a majority of the work that we do, what I do is to um, find a way to support the tribes. Um, identify some of the projected workforce needs and how to adapt our academic system to meet the needs of the tribes currently. And to also involve our tribal members. You know, we have a very young population of tribal members to provide them the opportunity to come back to CWC. During the pandemic, especially we're seeing students who need to step away for personal needs, for issues that are affecting their immediate multi-generational households. And we have young people who are able-bodied who accept that role and that responsibility at this time. So with those factors in mind, you know, we, we have our first Cobell Scholar since I've been hired. 
we have a Northern Arapaho tribal member who is our first Cobell scholar. Um, they advocated for themselves, they completed the application. And with this first step in that direction, just the level of responsibility and the level of pride that one person can have from one family is affecting so much of that dynamic of what education can mean. Um, you know, we're currently working and have spoken with Superintendent Shakespeare regarding the Bureau of Indian Affairs internship programs. Uh, we met with a student yesterday to discuss some additional opportunities nationwide. Uh, we have a student currently majoring in psychology with an interest in investigation. And with that motivation and with support from uh, Professor Fountain, she is looking at possibly moving into the East Coast area to look at opportunities within that very specific field to bring some sort of relatability back to the tribes in our region. We work with the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Rapo tribes to be able to identify funding models to support education, to utilize the funds that we've received through different foundations to address immediate needs of families that limit their ability to be successful at the college. Uh, we have cooperated collectively to provide opportunities for students to travel to and from Fort Washke, Dubois, Lander, Riverton, Arapaho, St. Stephens. And with your support and your ability to encourage, we're seeing students succeed. We're seeing them come every day. You know, the iTech building is an ideal location. You know, we had students arrive yesterday who utilized the, the elders room to say, you know, let's, let's, um, Let's relax a little bit. Let's provide a space for our representatives to come. Let's let them know that we're here. You know, we not, may not be able to spend the entire day, but let's take 10, 15, 20 minutes to be able to have a presence. We're coordinating with the CWC Jackson campus on a variety of activities. The powwow is one of the primary. We're trying to identify activities to assist the Shoshone, Eastern Shoshone tribe leading up to the Shoshone reunion. And our position is to be able to identify language barriers, language assistance, and what's needed to be able to allow our fluent speakers to provide assistance to our younger generation in the most adequate, safe environment, which we're now seeing as being this technology piece that PBS and um, CWC is able to provide. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Tendor? Ms. Or, uh, Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, Rory, the other thing I wanna throw out there since I have a great audience here and we have some tribal leaders here is remember um, as I would love an intern from CWC to come down and follow me in action when I'm at the Capitol. And there is an internship program and I think it would behoove us to really allow um, CWC students, particularly the indigenous students to come down. And I mean, I, I, I've welcomed it. You know, I welcomed it. And I, I think it's a great learning opportunity. It'll create buy-in. And I, and I just think it'd be a great opportunity and experience for them. Because I want the future generation to be sitting here in my, my shoe. So, you know, paving that way in that journey. So just, just remember that, Dr. Tyndall. You know, and we can collaborate. And I know the biggest obstacle is going to be the time and then the funding uh, to go and do that. So that's why I'm, I'm stating it here. But what a perfect opportunity for me to plead that I want some Native American students to come and intern, particularly probably with any committee or with any legislator, but particularly me. Thank you. Additional questions for CWC? Oh, Senator Case. If nobody else has any. Back to the tribal leadership uh, program. Um, I'm wondering if this committee could be helpful in any way with the program, um, along with uh, the business councils and any, and maybe you already do this where you have members of the business councils come and, and interact with students or maybe their field trips for the students go. I have to the business council. I, I don't really know, but it makes sense. But certainly I think we would love to help if, if you thought it could be a help uh, either as a organized committee or individually. I'm sure we'd all like to help them. I'm just throwing that out there. Mr. Nardine. Madam Chair and Senator Case, um, just, I think we have the opportunity to do this very well through the BAS program. One of the courses that we would take, that we require students to take in the 
um, option, tribal leadership option is a practicum course. Mm -hmm. And so being able to be an intern to shadow any form of go tribal government or any even tribal business, you know, is kind of what we're really looking to do that trying to make the education as contextual as possible. So that is just one of the things that we certainly would be able to do. And I will bring up uh, your suggestion, both of you to um, uh, Teresa Spoonhunter, Dr. Spoonhunter, because she's the one who would be setting that up and making that happen. Just so, no. so thank you very much. Just okay. if we could be helpful, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Or Mr. Co-Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just tag on to that because part of tribal leadership is being is having the ability and the knowledge and understanding how to interact with state leadership. And to Senator Case's point, this might be a great, there might be some opportunity to, to help introduce them between how that works. So we, our door is open. And then I, I believe uh, we have another comment. Is it Louisa? Yes. Um, I just have answers to a couple of the co committee's um, data questions. So first of all, the percentage of our traditional age students, which are the students under 25, that are um, identified as American Indian is pretty similar to the overall percentage for this fall, 12%, um, a little over 12%, so pretty similar. And then in terms of the percentage of nursing majors um, who are um, American Indian, it's also pretty similar to the overall population, but the percentage of nursing graduates that are American Indian is very low, um, like 2%. Um, and so we have a lot of, American Indian nursing majors, not that many who are actually graduating. So that's an area for us to work on. Mr. Posey. Madam Chairman, I just wanna to touch on a couple of things that um, we're venturing into and that's the, the history of the tribes here. Uh, this last year, we had a mandatory training for staff and faculty to do Wind River 101. Um, we've done that training for uh, the Rotary Kiwanis and the Wyoming Catholic College is in line to get that. Um, but I think that's very important that people from organizations or institutions know our history and why we um, are faced with some certain concerns in our community. I've been working with Whitney uh, Martinez, our counselor, to discuss um, more services in terms of um, historical trauma and some of those things that may affect some of our students coming here and to try to retain those students. A um, lot of times, um, and I've seen this where some tribal students come and they're very, some are very quiet, but they'll just kind of monitor, mean around and they, uh, then they're gone. So the idea is to acknowledge them, to uh, mentor them and to uh, see what we could do to help them more. Um, we're starting a, a program called the Tribal Wisdom Society in January. Uh, we're, all, we're looking at 10 to 12 students that'll um, learn the history of the reservation here. We'll go to Albuquerque, um, uh, being hosted by AIO. Uh, we'll go to the Crow Reservation and the Northern Cheyenne Reservation to see how their systems are. But it's just a program to... Um, to uh, help students to identify their tribalism. And I think, I hate to say studies show, because we're studied as a lot as a people, as a you and representative um, uh, Clifford know that, um, you know, we, uh, it shows that if people, tribal people know more about their identity and stuff, they're more, um, they're more opted to succeed in what they do. So I think we're coming across a new generation of people in our communities that don't know some of the oral history, some of the oral stories, and we wanna be a part of that. So I just wanted to plug that. Thank you. Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Ivan. And the other question I have, um, thank you for sharing that and the history of the tribes on the national um, topic of Indian boarding schools, and you talked about trauma, you know, and, and all of that, and it's specific to education. So my question is, you know, out in national media and the social media, and has that, how has that affected, or have you seen an effect on students acknowledging that history, 
then not only with our indigenous students, but with our non-indigenous students, are they asking more questions about the history? Because here at Wind River, we do have our own Indian boarding school history. You're a survivor. I'm a survivor of a, res of a board Indian boarding school parents. Um, and I'm the first generation that wasn't required to have to go to boarding school. But are you having those kind of conversations? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Posey. I think, I'm, as you know, I'm kind of a little bit hearing impaired, but um, I think that the, the identity issue with students is uh, really important. I think um, we want to introduce them to um, stories and stuff that are not learned in the westernized textbooks, you know, and um, we did some good, uh, as uh, President Tyndall mentioned, uh, we did some good uh, speaker series. John Washke was there. He did uh, Blood Quantum and Tribal Identity because most people don't even know what makes us tribal. You know, there's Blood Quantum, there's enrollment ordinances and those types of things that are kind of a mystery to people. And I think some of those things is important not only to uh, educate those that are not tribal, but I think it's time to start educating our own about our own issues. And some younger people through no fault of their own uh, may not know some of those stories are, and I think we'll, um, we'll come up better ahead. Uh, like I said, we're, we're just starting this process and we've done quite a bit so far, but we hope to um, expand that throughout the state. You know, the, the community, other community colleges wanted us to go and present on our speaker series. We went to Sheridan College and Gillette College and, um, Co-chairman Washke went with us and then the pandemic came. So we want to make sure that um, we spread the word about our wonderful and beautiful cultures and our people. Um, I and this is just on the side here. This is more for your committee, Madam Chairman. But I think I was talking to Senator Case and I talked to Representative Larson in the past about um, the select committee meetings maybe they should be held throughout the state um, and not just locally here close to the reservation so that more people are aware of our issues. You know, we get in this paradigm where we're just stuck in this box in the middle of Wyoming. So that's just um, an old plug from a reform politician. Mr. Tyndall. Yeah, I, I think um, you know, it's probably helpful for Stu, but in terms of the, um, the boarding school era, it's part of our um, Wind River 101 thing. Mm -hmm. The issue of intergenerational trauma was brought up to our trustees when we had out, out here in the lobby. Representative Clifford. Just to follow up to that. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Dr. Tyndall for that and addressing that. Um, and I'll take my, so Ivan can hear, I'm so sorry. Um, I apologize. Um, and you brought up a, a good point. Um, and Ivan, you did as well. And please, um, I, I would encourage you to focus on teaching the indigenous students about the boarding school too. Don't just assume they don't know because I can tell you, I sat with my Newa, my grandma, 
and I wanted to learn about her boarding school um, experiences, but it was very traumatic for her. She couldn't talk about it. She'd just cry and then she'd get angry. And why, why are you asking me these questions? Because she did, I didn't realize at the time she, she was, I, I was making her relive traumatic events that were physical, sexual, verbal, mental, spiritual abuse. And um, so please don't just assume all of our native students know the history of, of the boarding school. They need to learn it too. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Ms. Tendor. Madam Chairwoman, just to follow up, um, we had students that had followed the media initially when this issue had arisen in um, one of our students actually took interest and tied it back to CWC in that they're utilizing the GIS. They want to understand the system. They want to understand how they can utilize this technology to be able to go beyond the established boundaries of what we were told these, these, these grave markers are. We know within our communities and in oral history, it's a larger issue than just what's marked on the ground. And with the assistance of Northern Rapo Tipo, um, they've been very willing to share technology access and information with our students. And so for the one student that I'd spoken to, and we've had this conversation for a number of, <laughs> number of days is that it, it does change the way you see the world. It does affect your ability to want to learn and it has an impact on your drive to succeed. Um, we were just talking about um, Ivan and I, um, my younger brother, we also attended boarding schools voluntarily. And so for us here at CWC, we have students who represent the Bureau of Indian Education. We have five students currently who are graduates of a BIE school. And what we see in their population are these conversations as their schools are identified as a burial site and the conversations that they want to be engaged in. So as individual students who are currently in higher education, we're trying to identify their opportunity to be a part of these conversations. But as a collective community, we cannot engage in that until we can establish what that is going to look like within our tribal communities. And so um, we defer back to tribal leadership in what direction and what opportunities they would like CWC to engage collectively to have these conversations. Thank you. Mr. Tyndall. I'm not wanting to belabor the point, but there's a great opportunity. September 30th, I believe, is Wear Orange Day. And that was something that we sent out to students saying it's basically uh, remembering, the, remembering the boarding school error day. And we sent out two videos. One was a very short clip on why wear orange. But also there's a one hour documentary that, um, so a, a group of documentarians um, um, documented hundreds of stories from people who survived the boarding school era and their children who could recount the stories. And it is a tearjerker as just as um, representative Clifford referred to, there is rape and abuse and beating and dungeons. I mean, you're thinking like, can't be. And then you hear the stories and you go, okay, I get it. That's enough abuse to be genetically impactful. And so I, it, it really brings the message home. If anyone is interested, I'd be glad to share it. But if you would to hear the stories yourself, you say, okay, I get it. I, I finally get it. And, it's, and it's, so it's important, I agree, Representative Clifford, that the power of that story to really bring home a background of, of, of deep, deep psychological troubles being passed down, it, um, it's helpful in understanding. And I think through understanding, we build better friendships and relations. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for CWC? I just want to add, my, my parents both were boarding school survivors and my mom couldn't even, same experience as Representative Clifford. Um, the more she talked about it, the more upsetting it was for her. And um, I think that, you know, anecdotally, it certainly has motivated me to really reconnect and in one way is taking, understanding my language. And so I've been sharing with my co-chair, I'm actually taking Navajo online and it's mm -hmm. been an adventure. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite prepared to address the group just yet. <laughs> <laughs> Navajo, working on it, but anyway, right. thank you, right, gentlemen thank you. Thank you. and ladies for all your testimony. Um, we had representative, uh, or excuse me, Dr. Caldwell from the community colleges who um, is also on our agenda, but since we're talking about the colleges, I thought maybe it would make some sense to change the order up a little bit, have her present, and then move on to um, the president of the university, if that's okay. 
Uh, President Seidel, is that okay with you? Sure. Perfect. And, and Heather, was there anything else you had? I've seen you trying to get our attention previously. Oh, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to remind people to please turn their mics on and to speak close into them because in this room there's quite good acoustics but it, it's not necessarily certain that the recording or the zoom land people would be able to hear good reminder all righty hello dr caldwell welcome uh hello and uh good afternoon uh madam chairwoman uh mr co-chair members of the select committee i'm dr sandy caldwell i'm the executive director of the wyoming community college commission for the state of wyoming i will be very brief uh, but i really wanted to just add on to um what's uh what the enrollment is across the community colleges and uh, just some uh, some highlights as you then can turn over to President Seidel to talk about the University of Wyoming. Um, all seven of the community college uh, colleges, I will say we do have eight community college districts now with the, with the passage of Gillette Community College uh, District on the ballot in, in August. However, all those students are still enrolled under Northern Wyoming Community College District. So all seven of those colleges and including the Gillette campus at Gillette College do have Native American students. They are represented at all eight of those locations. Um, the most recent enrollment report, which was adopted yesterday at the regular meeting of the Community College Commission up at Sheridan College, um, does have this information publicly available. Um, all eight of those uh, locations, there's about 500 students that um, that self-identify as Native American. And as you can imagine, uh, by far, uh, Central Wyoming College has the majority of those students. Nonetheless, they are all at all of the campuses. Um, when I looked at that, we also have a large number, and this was something that was brought up just now by Central Wyoming College, is that we do also have a large number of students who report as two or more races, but we don't necessarily have the breakdown uh, for that. What we know from what you just heard from, uh, from uh, President Tendall and his staff is that they really work on the local level at the institution to identify how many of those uh, that identify as two or more races in which one of those might be Native American. And across the colleges, we find that um, that is actually a large number of those individuals. Um, I will tell you that a disproportionate number of those who identify are, again, at Central Wyoming College. That is not surprising. The second thing that I would point out is that we also have a large number of students who uh, do not report uh, what their uh, uh, ethnicity is and what race that, that might be. Uh, and again, a, a large disproportionate number, and actually it's almost like 1,600 out of the almost 26, 27,000 students across the community colleges um, with a disproportionate number of those also at Central Wyoming College. So again, when you see the number that's gonna be reported on the enrollment report, and then the percentage that you're able to see at uh, Central Wyoming College, they've been able to really tease that out uh, a bit more accurately from the students because they are not required to report exactly which one, uh, which one that is. Uh, something I also wanna share is that all uh, eight of the locations do celebrate a Native American Heritage Month of November. Uh, and, and I also want to share that they do rely very heavily. Again, you heard this from the Central Wyoming College um, staff there that the colleges do reach out to Central. Um, it is one thing to be uh, uh, working on, on best practices for Native, support of Native American students. It is another uh, to really be uh, honed in on what actually works in Wyoming. And uh, Central, as you have heard, is our uh, officially designated MSI institution and Native American institution. And they do have uh, a lot of best practices on not only how to support Native American students, but how to support Wyoming Native American students. And I will tell you, it has had an impact. We do see disproportionate completion rates with the support of the students. We do see that uh, increasing and you have seen that 
with the data provided by um, Central Wyoming College. I just want to provide a couple of highlights from uh, the colleges and then pull this up so I don't uh, get this wrong, just to highlight some examples. Um, Northwest College in Powell, and as well as their extension campuses, actually has Native Ways Club that has been active for over 20 years. Um, and they actually do an annual Buffalo Feast in November. Uh, and it's, it's actually uh, something that is an entire campus celebration led by their, um, their uh, Native Ways uh, Club. They do um, performances and actually all of the colleges invite that, the performances, uh, performers from the nations to do that. Uh, they do hoop dancers from the Native uh, Reservation. And, and, and just a whole uh, host of things to try to really um, uh, bring forward the Native American uh, uh, culture uh, and cultural competency onto the campus and, and what that really means. Uh, I will also highlight, for example, our, our largest community college uh, right now, which is Casper College, has a couple of varieties. I will tell you they are heavily supported by BOCES to help them with, uh, with the STAR program, for example, which is successful transition and academic transition. And then they also have what is called the Student Success Advocate, who uh, really serves as a resource for young adults that are uh, particularly those that may not be directly from Natrona County, and uh, do focus on Native American students uh, in supporting them. They, they use this success advocate uh, program to really customize support for a, a variety of students in different demographics. So I, I think it's really a unique approach that, uh, that Casper College uh, uses. And then Western uh, Wyoming Community College, um, oh, and I wanted to mention several of the colleges do offer and have uh, specific courses uh, in Native American, in um, uh, North American Indian cultures, Native American culture and literature, and then um, uh, more specifically to focus on the local uh, Wind River Indian Reservation, the Eastern Shoshone and the Northern Arapaho. Uh, Western actually does quite an extensive uh, Native American Heritage Celebration Month. And they do entrench that across the campus and they embedded it, embed it across their curriculum, which is really a unique approach. And I think they did uh, really get that from the advice of Central Wyoming College on how to do that. Uh, they again, bring in speakers, um, uh, they bring in uh, dancers, and they also bring in some really uh, interactive uh, student uh, activities uh, from our Wind River uh, Reservation, the tribes of the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho. And so uh, there is actually a lot that is going on. There's, there is uh, a bit more, I will tell you that three of the colleges in addition uh, to um, uh, uh, Central do participate on a, on a rotating or a periodic basis for the Northern, uh, for the Native American Education Conference. Uh, because that is uh, very unique in, in how to help support um, uh, our Native American students. And then I'll just wrap this up because I know you do have uh, President Seidel. Uh, on a personal note, I do appreciate the conversation on the Native American boarding school. Uh, my own great grandfather was boarded at Jones Academy in Oklahoma. And my grandmother often shared stories on how tra very traumatizing that experience was for him and how it impacted uh, her whole life. I would not have known that if it had not been for the oral history and storytelling that my own grandmother passed down. So I, I will say Jones Academy is now a supportive learning environment but uh, that, that the, I wasn't expecting the conversation that the boarding history to come up and I I just wanted to share that on a on a very personal note. And with that, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, um, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that I could. I would probably have to go back and get uh, additional information. I'm very happy to do so. Thank you, Dr. Caldwell. Qu questions for Dr. Caldwell? Uh, seeing none, just a brief update if you wanted to add anything, but I just wanted to inform the committee that we have on your joint education committee have formed a small work group to work on the Wyoming's Tomorrow Scholarship. 
which is intended for um, individuals who are have been out of school for a while, older, but want to go back and maybe get their associate's degree or retool or retrain themselves. We've been meeting offline a lot. Uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Caldwell, for weighing in and also just let the folks in CWC know that we are hard at work on this bill. And my colleagues, we are working very hard to bring you um, something that we hope both chambers can get behind. So thank you, Dr. Caldwell, for that additional work. Yes. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, and I, I did not mention that, and I apologize. I should have said that, that the, uh, the legislatively created Educational Attainment Executive Council that has been a champion for that adult scholarship and in part of that is a recognition of the minority populations in our state, and it specifically calls out our Native American uh, population and the Wind River in, uh, in reservation with the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho. So it is intended absolutely to support um, our Native American population because they are specified, and that was the legislature's um, uh, direction to us. So I, I'm so glad you brought that up. I was remiss. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Caldwell. Um, the next person on our agenda is President Seidel from the university. Welcome, President. And then is there anyone else on your team that you'd like to bring up at this time? So thank you, Chair Ellis and, and Co-Chair um, Larson and to the committee, thanks. I'm, I'm honored to be here uh, and I would like to tell you about sort of my personal journey uh, having come here and trying to get to know the Native American communities uh, in the last year. I have with me uh, Bill Mai, who is our uh, government affairs person and James Trosper, the director of the um, High Plains at American Indian Research Institute at the University of Wyoming. Um, I've spent a good part of the last year trying to learn about uh, the Native American community. It's been a complex year with uh, a lot of challenges, particularly due to COVID-19 that has in some, time, in some ways uh, slowed our engagement. We've, we've made a number of engagements that I'll tell you about, but uh, I would I'd look forward to doing much more and also to building on the legacy that my predecessor, Lori Nichols, I know was a, a real champion for in, in terms of developing relationships and, and programs with the Native American communities. Um, I, I really began my engagement, I would say, even during the interview when I came here uh, nearly two years ago now um, with James, I, I met and I remember following up with him and uh, he sent me a, a very thick packet of, of information that I, I've studied deeply and we had a, a couple of follow-up calls. I also, uh, I checked my calendar um, on the first, my first day of work, actually July 1st last year uh, in, on, in 2020, we had a phone call just to begin to begin the engagement um, formally once I was here. Um, when I, when I got to the university, I started uh, with the entire university community, uh, what I called four pillars, um, which included that the university needs to become more digital, more entrepreneurial, more interdisciplinary, and more inclusive. And I think all four of those apply quite deeply to the Native American communities. And so we're very, very serious about that, not only the inclusive pillar, but we've talked specifically a lot of, with communities around entrepreneurship and around uh, digital literacy, which I'll, I'll come back to in a minute. But I just want you to know that we've thought I think pretty deeply about the things that we should be doing in the future. And uh, I think you'll see more in engagement in, in these areas coming up. Um, among the themes that we've discussed, and I I'd like to tell you about a timeline of engagements that we've had in a minute, but I'll say student success and recruitment is clearly essential and partnership in particular with Central Wyoming College and, uh, and more broadly than that is important for us. Uh, they're clearly the leaders. I've had uh, uh, many discussions with uh, President Tyndall about how we can engage more deeply through partnership, including engaging on, with our provost and, uh, uh, and others from the University of Wyoming uh, to talk about um, programs that we might like to strengthen as a result of our conversations with the, uh, the Native American communities. Also, um, research and, and development collaborations. Uh, we in the last year, as, as you heard from President Tyndall, we already have programs, particularly around the EPSCOR and uh, INBRI programs, EPSCOR from the National Science Foundation and INBRI from the National Institutes of Health. 
um, in particular, Central Wyoming College is a very strong partner there, and uh, Professor um, Spoonhunter is, is uh, deeply engaged there. We also we wrote a proposal last year, which sadly didn't get funded, but on artificial intelligence and its application, particularly to environmental studies, that Central Wyoming College and Professor Spoonhunter were actually a, a, a co-PIs in the project. And so, although that didn't get funded, it was a $20 million proposal, so it would have been really very significant, but uh, it just shows a sense of where we're trying to engage. Um, we have, as you know, my background is in... Um, not only computing and science, but uh, also economic development. And I spent a lot of time thinking about how the university can become a better engine for economic development to advance the, the state of Wyoming, uh, previously in other states. And this is an area that I've met with the business councils of, of both tribes and also um, uh, with Central Wyoming College in particular to grow entrepreneurship opportunities to think about how we can help Native American communities begin to grow their own businesses with support. Uh, and so it's, it's a, a, lot of, a lot of work needs to be done there, but we're really com committed to it. Um, well, I, there's something very interesting that, that happened. I, I have a, a strong background with the Department of Energy and I was once on the board of Argonne National Laboratory and I've been following up with uh, the labs and they have, they've asked me specifically, can we find opportunities for workforce development with Native American communities? They, they anticipate there being a lot more opportunities with the national labs, with the University of Wyoming providing a kind of a liaison. So we're in active discussions in particular with Argonne, but also with some of the the other national labs. And um, one, one last thing I'll say here is that we have uh, discussed something that I'm really quite excited about. We have a, a thing called the AMK Ranch in um, uh, Grand Teton National Park that has a, a couple of hundred acres and it's just a com beautiful, beautiful complex, which we're uh, putting significant funds into right now to renovate, to create, uh, I hope ultimately a year round facility. And some of the conversations we've had with, with James and, and others is um, to use that as a site where we could begin to focus on um, Native American cultural training and, and, and traditional ways. And so it would be a great site for that. And we've had it even in the last week of some discussions on that. So anyway, Anyway, that that's just sort of an orientation for where where I've been coming from and what I've been working on. Um, I, just to get back to the some of the statistics and numbers, we we currently have seventy three students at the university who identify strongly as Native American, um, and that that's a bit different from the over two hundred students we have that that identify in part as Native American, potentially with other, other um, uh, ethnicities. But so that's, that, that's what we would consider our core. And um, right now that breaks down as 53 undergraduates. Um, unfortunately, only seven of which this year are freshmen. So we're, we've had, I think, a, a downtick in our usual cohort of students. We need to address that. I, I think that's in part related to COVID-19. I mean, in, in enrollments are down somewhat all around, but I particularly noticed that and it's not something we're, we'd like, but we will grow that. We have 20 graduate students of the 73 that are um, Native Americans. Um, and I think this is, this is kind of exciting. Some enrolled in PhD programs, law school, um, uh, other master's programs, but um, my goal would be to uh, have some homegrown um, faculty members that uh, actually then become professors at the university, and, and, and which I, I don't think we have any that are, are, are strongly identifies Native American in terms of the faculty. The majors, um, this is also, I think, quite encouraging to me. Um, you might think that our majors might be focused around Native American studies. That is not true. We have Native American studies uh, among the majors, but they're, they're distributed throughout the entire university uh, quite broadly. The most popular major is psychology, uh, kinesiology, um, law, uh, of course, things Native American studies and environmental science are, are strong. And we do have PhD students in both um, biomedical studies and, and uh, molecular biology. So um, so that's, that's, I think, generally encouraging. We're committed to doing better over time. Um, another thing we're committed to do uh, more of is grow scholarships to support Native American students. We currently have about uh, $2.2 million in endowments and gifts that are supporting a, a couple of dozen Native American students uh, currently, and that's typical, the, the rel rel relatively small amounts of money, but can go a long way to help support students. And so um, we worked very hard in the last year. In fact, uh, I have a, a gift announcement that, that we made last year, I, I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, we have MOUs with both tribes, and uh, I, I have copies of them here, and I've reviewed them. 
they basically say that we will work together, uh, we will grow our networks of, of collaboration uh, with uh, uh, ourselves and with third parties, including with the community colleges, and we will identify more financial support. Um, those uh, uh, MOUs expire next September 30th, so just about a year from now. And I think that gives us a great opportunity to think about how we can go beyond where we currently are. And I'm, I'm committed to doing that with both tribes. So great, great opportunity going forward. So um, not, not to be too tedious, I wanted to, to point out a few things that we've done in terms of our, our timeline since we got, since I got here. I, I know a lot, of, I'm just building on a lot of effort, particularly of Lori Nichols before me. But um, we um, began our engagement in July last year, so about 15 months ago. Um, we had a meeting, which uh, I was coming back from Jackson, and we decided to stop at the um, the Frank White uh, Center, uh, we, where we, we that was in uh, just about a year ago, just a couple of months after I got here. Uh, we had a lot of discussions there on how we can work together, planning ideas for the future, and, and that was with James Trosper, with uh, Co-Chairman uh, Lee Sp Spoonhunter, uh, uh, John Washakie, Wind River. Uh, Tribal College President uh, Marlon, uh, Marion, uh, Marlon Spoonhunter and um, and uh, Teresa Spoonhunter as well, and I, that was a lengthy and, and quite uh, uh, in deep engaged meeting where we talked about many things, including I think the first time the idea that we might have uh, some activities around the the uh, AMK Ranch together on sort of Native American studies. Um, so so that was in, in some ways the beginning of my first real engagement there. I noted that there was not a optical fiber to that building. And we have spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to support the, the growth of uh, uh, high-speed networking to support digital literacy and, and the kinds of applications that are needed there. Still on that, <laughs> not, not really, it's a complicated topic, but I think that, that should be a simple one to, to achieve. Um, I've also visited on campus, of course, many of our uh, uh, centers there, the, the Native American Education um, Research Center, Cultural Center, uh, and with um, uh, Raynette Tendor, and of course, Hippari in the same building there on the campus, something that was opened up under my predecessor. We're certainly committed to continuing that uh, and, uh, and strengthening that over time. Uh, last April, we had a, 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 a very, very a heartfelt uh, meeting where we honored Zadora Enos, and there was the Zadora Enos Excellence Fund with um, support from the um, of the Chief Washiki um, gift announcement there, and that was aimed at supporting further supporting community engagement. It's just an example of the kinds of things we're doing, and we'll do more of going forward. Um, at the at the uh, May graduation ceremony which I am so glad we had, you know, we didn't actually, we planned not to have it, but we decided that even though we had coronavirus, we found a way to have that ceremony in person. It was probably the best day of the whole year last year. And uh, we had a, an honorary degree that we offered uh, posthumously to Crawford White Eagle. And I just have to say that was one of the most emotional events of the year. I remember standing on the stage as that ceremony uh, took place and watching the students uh, all sitting there, just their eyes wide open. And it meant a lot to the, I think the entire community. And I was certainly very moved by that. So, so anyway, just to wrap up a little bit, things that we're talking about um, going forward. Um, uh, I mentioned the AMK Ranch. I'm very excited about potential programs that we can develop there out uh, uh, on Jackson Lake, um, where there are a number of meetings that are planned uh, on on uh, August, uh, sorry, October 22nd, just next month. Um, we'll be meeting with the Arapaho Business Council on uh, uh, the f I think it's the 5th of November. We'll be meeting with the Shoshone Business Council in Laramie. And um, we're planning an event, a community engagement event um, at the, on, at, on the reservation um, where we'll open up an office at the uh, Frank White um, facility. Uh, sorry, Wise, I'm sorry, Frank Wise facility. I'm sorry, uh, Frank Wise. And um, we will then continue to develop uh, our relationships there. And um, I think that we're already talking also about 150th uh, anniversary uh, celebration of the Grand Teton National Park opening in May. And I think that will be a time when we can talk about what we might do with the, the AMK Ranch. So there's more, I, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what we've been doing and uh, quite uh, very pleased to be trying to do more going forward. Questions from committee members or did anyone else from your group wanna um, offer any remarks? Mr. Trosper? 
I, I Turn on your mic and make sure you introduce yourself. Thank you. This is on. Uh, the, there okay. you go. All right, I, uh, I'm James Chosper, uh, Director of High Plains American Indian Research Institute. And um, basically, we, we had a couple of meetings this week um, to kind of plan for this meeting. And it was really um, the idea that I would only be here in case there were questions uh, from, from anybody here, that uh, just to help uh, support President Seidel. So. Thank you. Questions for committee member, Senator Case? Just wanna say hello to my old friend. Thank you. Other questions? And my other old friend. <laughs> and my new friend. New friends. new friends and old friends. Any other questions? Thank you. Mr. Co-Chairman? Thank you, Madam Chairman. So, President Seidel, just a, a couple of questions as you, as you reflect and look. You're a data guy, I've come to learn. Mm -hmm. You read numbers and you put them together. And I am realizing that uh, uh, COVID impacted, but as you look at the, the, the number of of students that identify themselves as Native American is, or is is that good? Is that bad? Is there just kind of your impression of where you, you think that should be and where that goes? Then as you evaluate the programs um, at this point in your in your um, in your administration, the, the programs available to students are. Native American students, are you? Are we good in your mind? Tell so. Can you touch on those two things first, please? Sure, President Seidel. Thank you, um, Chair Ellis. Yes, um, I think the numbers are are not adequate. Frankly, we. Am I, yeah, it's on. You can hear me, right? So, yeah, I think the numbers could be better. Uh, I think so. I just I reported the numbers as they are. I would love to see them improve, and I think we have work to do in order to to better support, first of all, the introduction of Native American students to the university, and then to make sure that we build community that is uh, that is welcoming and supportive. And of course, we're working on that. So, and, and the the um, the the uh, center, um, both the, the research center of Hipari and the um, the Native American Cultural Center led by Renette Tendor are examples of that, but we're committed to doing more. In fact, I, I left out in my summary here, we have a Indigenous Peoples Day uh, next Monday, just one example of that. We have that annually, that's that's uh, supported by the Native American Student uh, Organization. But um, so I guess my point is, I would like to see those numbers grow. I would like to see it grow through direct engagement and through transfers of the community colleges from the community colleges. And I'd like to make sure that we, uh, we strengthen our our offerings, of which there are many, there are many Native American organizations on campus. So it's not like we don't have them, but we can do better going forward, I think. Follow up, Mr. Kocher. And then how do you feel about the retention rate for our Native American students? That's all, I think that's a challenge um, wherever, but how do you feel that's going? And then if just your thoughts on that. Yes, thanks. Mr. President. I'm sorry, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Ellis. So yes, um, I, I have checked the numbers. And so because the numbers are small in terms of the number of, of say freshmen, and we, we monitor how many freshmen then are retained next year and how many graduate within six years. Those are the two key indicators. Uh, the numbers vary. The worst in the last five years was a 33% freshman to sophomore retention rate. The best was about 65%. So the numbers go up and down. Um, it, it's right now this last year at 55%, the last uh, year that we have uh, numbers for, which is 2019 to 2020. So those numbers are below what we have for the, uh, the overall population. So we wanna close that gap. Um, um, there are, however, numbers that uh, I think are, are better than many universities, in fact. So we, it shows that we have programs that are at least to some degree successful, but we have to do better. In terms of the, the six-year graduation rate, I just, I have this number. Where is this number? I have it written down. It's right here. Six-year graduation rate is, is, is at 50% as well. So these are numbers that we will strive to improve. Thank you, Mr. Coach. Just as a follow-up, could we get like maybe all of that for a 10-year look back period? Mm -hmm. And the reason I ask is I think our intention or our excitement with the Native American Research and Cultural Center's opening was that we were creating that culture to support retention. And so I would be curious to know kind of pre-opening of that facility and then post and just on all these metrics, just the enrollment of freshmen as well as the retention information you have. Mm -hmm. And then so we have so a baseline comparison, how it is for the university in general 
for other demographics so we can kind of compare those numbers. That would be wonderful. We will provide that. And I'll, I'll say, looking at the numbers, it wasn't a straight line going up or down. It's sort of, and I think, of course, that center was really launched just before COVID hit, which has perhaps created additional challenges for us. But but we'll give you the numbers. And But I think my main message is, I think it is helping and we will strive to have it help more going forward. Okay. And then I have another question. Um, you had touched on professors at the University of Wyoming and a desire to hire more Amer American Indian professors. Can you give us a summary? I mean, has the University of Wyoming, do we have any native professors currently or people that are indigenous teaching? Um, thank you. Thanks, uh, Chair Ellis. So, um, I, I do not know for sure. I, there may be faculty who identify as Native American in part, but uh, I, I do not think we have, certainly don't have a, a level that we should. However, it is a problem. For example, in science and engineering, very few Native American faculty are available nationwide. And so this is, it's, it's a national problem, but as, as you know, I'm a scientist, I'm very, very keen to, to support this. And when I noted that our, some of our graduate students are actually in the sciences and doing PhDs, I think that's a good sign, but we have to work hard to, to grow that. I think it makes a big difference having a professor in a classroom or a professor as a mentor that is a Native American or is, is in any ethnic group so that people from those groups feel that they have people that are like them that they can look up to. Thank you. And then I did have one more question. And James, if you wanted to tag on, I'll, I'll ask my question after you have a chance to comment. Go ahead. I, um, I just wanted to touch on um, and add to uh, what uh, President Seidel said in regards to um, Native American faculty. And I wanted to, I, I don't know if you guys remember or not, but Soon after uh, President Nichols had come, we established the advisory committee to the president. And that advise, advisory committee developed a five-year strategic plan. And within that five-year strategic plan was uh, some goals and some metrics that, that we had set to, um, to recruit and, uh, and bring more Native American faculty to campus. That was one of the areas that I think was really important within that five, five-year strategic plan. And that, that's something that I think I would like to um, make sure that each of you guys have a copy of so that maybe we can take a, a look again at that. And, and there was a lot of work put into that and, um, and some real clear cut, cut goals that we uh, set to achieve um, just exactly that. One of the other things I wanted to touch on real quickly is the enrollment. Um, uh, Lloyd Larson asked about uh, the enrollment, if we think that's in the right place. One of the things that we've looked at in the past was really what is the population in the state of Wyoming? And the goal was then let's try to get, have that population reflected in the student body of the University of Wyoming. And if we were to do that, um, our goal would be around 300 students. And so we're far below that goal. Um, and it's gonna take a lot of work the five-year strategic plan also addresses some of the uh, ways that we can increase those, those um, numbers. And thank you. And then the last question I had to do um, was with the restructuring. And I know that everyone says, university, you need to consolidate, be more efficient, but whoa, wait, you're consolidating my program? I get that. Um, but I did want to just understand um, the changes that were made to the American Indian Studies program. I do remember that being in the list of things that somehow got moved. Can you explain what that decision was? I, I have to get back to you on, on where that stands in terms of the reorganization. There were uh, a number of proposals that are, have all been uh, commented on by uh, faculty. And so the, a, a number of reports, uh, probably at least two dozen reports have just come into the provost in the last week. So I, I do not know exactly where that stands right now, but we certainly have commitment to continue uh, Native American studies at the university. Further questions for the university, Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I got a comment, then a question, if you don't mind, a couple of questions. Um, so my comment is I'm, I'm uh, very troubled that we don't have the director of the American Indian Center here present sitting at the table that works in the trenches with the students. Um, and she is from this reservation and proud enrolled Northern Arapaho. So that's my concern. And so my question would be, 
why is she not here? Because there's some questions that she could probably privy to on exactly what she's doing. My other question is going to piggyback off of um, Madam Chairwoman, uh, Co-Chair uh, Larson's question is back to the retention. So what specifically are the top two obstacles that are affecting retention specific to American Indian students? And, you know, are you addressing that? Are you, do you realize, do you know what those are? Thank you. President Seidel. Thank you, Ch Chair Ellis. Uh, and uh, Representative Clifford. So um, thanks for both questions. Um, on um, not having the director of the, the, the cultural center here, it's just an oversight on, on my part. I didn't really know, frankly, what was to be expected here. So I, I brought uh, some representation, but um, I, I've got that message and we will make sure next time to, to have her here. Um, President Seidel. Yes, yes, please. Madam Chairman, in, in, in Representative Clifford, a little bit in, in defense of the of the good president of the university as we give LSO some pretty great staff that we'd like to have President Seidel here. And so I think trying to stay within that, I, I don't think we we're trying to do that, but he, so I'll take some of the blame. Yeah, please continue. But, uh, but anyway, the message is received, and, but I have visited with the center and, and we've had very, very good, strong relationships. So that, that's at least one part. Um, the second question about the, um, the factors for Native American student retention. I don't know if, if we really fully understand it. I know community is an important part of it. And so, um, and I've talked a lot with Renette specifically about this point. Um, and I, I, I do think that that's an important part of it. I think also um, uh, there could be financial issues and that's why we're very interested in raising our scholarship funds and so on. I, I can't say for sure if those are the two dominant factors. I'm, I'm not sure since the numbers are relatively small. I don't know if, if we have a comprehensive study, but perhaps uh, James or, or Bill might have a further uh, detail on the answer. Uh, James or Mr. Trosper, did you wanna to respond to that? Yeah, um, so one of the, there's a couple of things that I wanted to uh, respond to regarding uh, this this conversation. Uh, one is that the um, I think it's really important, like um, uh, Representative Clifford pointed out that you know there's a number of different organizations on campus, um, you know, work that we're doing with the foundation, um, student retention through the Native American Center uh, research. Uh, through Hapari, and also um, the American Indian Studies is under academic affairs. And so these are all different areas that uh, we work on with, with under the, the scope of uh, Native American um, issues uh, on campus. And, and that was part of the reason why that um, advisory committee was pulled together because we had representation from all of those areas, um, had, had them all at the table to uh, uh, and basically gave reports on a regular basis. And I think it's really important to hear from all of those entities um, and, and at, at the very least get a report that we can uh, provide here at this meeting. Uh, in terms of American Indian studies, and that was one of the questions that you had, um, th there, you know, th there has that, that's an area and of course was also addressed in the five-year strategic plan that we really need to find a solution uh, to, the, to a problem there. One is that we had uh, Judy Antell who was hired for American Indian Studies and was at the University of Wyoming for over 30 years. Her, the line, line item basically in the budget that provided for her position was under arts and sciences. Um, after she retired and left, the person who took over that position was a, a professor from the English department. And so they took on that responsibility. After he left, then uh, Angela Jaime um, stepped in and she was from the College of Education. And so that really creates some problems because there, there's not the stability that we need. If there was a line item and a funding source that provided for that position, I think that that's something that's really important and that we addressed in that uh, five-year strategic plan. And so that, that, that is something that I think that we need to work on so that we have some stability there. Um, one, of the, one of the things, because you also brought this up, is that everybody looks at their programs and say, we don't want our program cut. American Indian Studies is in a little bit different situation because we have an MOU 
that the that the university signed with both business councils that say that we're going to provide that American Indian studies. And so we need we need to live up to that commitment. And right now we don't have a funding source to do it. And so I think it's really important that that's one of the first things that we address is um, if, if we're going to live up to the to the commitment that we made in those MOUs to the tribes that we do provide that uh, American Indian studies and have a funding source for it. Just to follow up to make sure I understand, do you currently have someone then heading up the American Indian Studies Department? Well, so the after the last person uh, left, she uh, went to a different university and that, that was Angela Jaime. Um, there is a advisory committee that kind of oversees American Indian studies. And all of those um, professors come from different areas uh, at the university. And that advisory committee has kind of stepped in and, and is doing their best to kind of cover. Um, so there's no one person that's director of American Indian studies right now. Um, the advisory committee is, is really trying to do their best all to pitch in and, uh, and cover. Uh, those, those courses. Thank you for that follow-up information. Additional questions, Representative Clifford? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, my other question I would have is a deeper dive into, so we have the Northern Apple Endowment and Chief Washke Endowment. I may be missing another one, but it'd be good. I would like you guys to dig a little deeper when we're talking about recruitment and retention, but the students that get awarded those, those endowments, you know, what's their success rate? You know, that would be good to really look at that, that, that data. I'm a recipient of the Northern Apple Endowment, you know, and, and it was awesome and it really helped me. Um, and so that's important as well too. And I would just echo the concern is, uh, what's the timeline to fill the American Indian Studies, you know, directorship, where's that at? President Seidel. Thanks, Chair Ellis. Um, uh, I agree totally that uh, we certainly well need to grow more endowments and, and so that I mean that's sort of a little bit behind your question um in terms of the timeline for uh, finding a, a director of that program I have to consult with the provost I don't really know where that stands right now but I, I will get back to you on that specifically uh, thank you president Seidel you know and please direct it to the committee so we mm -hmm. we all get that information mm -hmm. okay uh, Mr. Trosper yes I'd, I'd just like to um add uh a uh, to the answer to uh, Representative Clifford in regards to the endowments. Um, those endowments are really important. And, you know, I sometimes I don't think that people really realize situations for a lot of our Native American students and how difficult it is and how big of an obstacle uh, funding is um, for students to be able to go and, and to be successful uh, at the university. Um, and, and, and I'll just give you one real, really short ex example. We have a student that just graduated last year. She applied to law school, um, did all her tests, her interviews and everything and got accepted to law school. Um, immediately after being accepted, she was told that she had to, that she had to uh, put a deposit uh, down. And, and you know, the, I, I'm not sure what that process is. Uh, you might know a little bit better what, what they were asking for. But they asked her for five hundred dollars, and you know her her scholarship that she was going to get wouldn't have come until in the fall, um, and she uh, she she just didn't know what she was going to do. She had gone to all of her family; her family couldn't help her. She ended up doing a crowdfunding and was able to get the money to to uh, pay for that. But she and you know she's one of those people that I know is going to be successful. She's going to be a really good attorney and represent our people well. And so we're, we're hoping that, that we wanna give her all the support that we can. And that's really the whole reason that we established those endowments. Um, the Northern Rare Apple Endowment, you know, at, at right now it's grown over to uh, 2.3 million and uh, was established in 1989. Of course, the Chief Washke uh, Foundation established an endowment, which is a lot younger and hasn't grown as much. But we established that in 2003. The, so far, we've provided over 250 scholarships. We've help, helped over 250 students. Um, and you know, we've had uh, graduates from uh, pharmacy, from law school, um, again, like he said, all across the campus. Um, and 
these, these scholarships and these endowments are really important. The Northern Arapaho tribe established the Northern Arapaho Endowment, but they also established the Sky People Endowment. And the Northern Arapaho Endowment really is focused on the uh, graduate students and upper level students. And so there were students that were freshmen and sophomores that, that kind of were falling through the cracks um, as far as funding goes. And that was the whole purpose of them establishing this new uh, endowment. It's called the Sky People uh, Endowment. So there's two endowments now that the Arapaho tribe has established, uh, two endowments that the Chief Washke, um, uh, foundation has established the Chief Washke Memorial Endowment and also the Zidora Teton Enos Excellence Fund. Uh, that was established in uh, 2021. And, and really the, the purpose of that is to address critical needs and priorities of the Wind River Reservation community, including entrepreneurship, cultural and language preservation and community de development activities. Recipients selected annually based on demonstrated excellence in Pernope promoting the economic independence of the Wind River Reservation community. community. And so we, we set it up not as that, that endowment, not as a scholarship, but really as an excellence fund so that we would be able to do more things and help uh, more people. For example, the student that wasn't getting her scholarship, we would have the ability to be able to help give her funding to, to pay for that, um, that deposit, for example. And so I think you know that that's a really important point. And you know it, what's important about the statistics statistics that you're asking for is that we've collected that data already. Um, the Chief Washke Foundation; uh, those numbers are very close to the success rate and the graduation rate of the university as a whole. And so is the Northern Arapaho Endowment. Um, those those numbers are very comparable to the university as a whole. And even though uh, the, the Native American students in general, those are a little bit lower than the university, those two scholarships, um, the students that have participated in those two scholarships, those numbers are in, in com uh, very comparable to the success rate for uh, the general population of UW. Follow up, Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, thank you for the, the information. And I kind of just want to share, um, uh, with the committee and, and with, with you all here, the UW representatives is, there was a study either uh, dissertation done and it looked at 10 Northern Arapaho women who successfully went to the University of Wyoming, and graduated. So it looks at all these parameters. I'm included, I'm one of the 10 Northern Arapaho that was included in that dissertation. So it's either an 06 or 07 done by Dr. Uh, Lorinda Lindley. And it's, it, it's, it's, I think that there's some good data there that we could look at that could help you mm -hmm. and have some good information Thank for you. why we succeeded, what our obstacles were. Thank you. Thank you. Follow-up question. Um, as you know, I serve on the education committee. We've been talking a lot about adjusting some things to the Hathaway scholarship. And I think that is what, just kind of an underlying concern is, you know, if we're setting students up for success in high school, they should be eligible for these scholarships. And so I am a little concerned that there's probably underrepresentation, in my guess, about the number of Native students who are qualifying for some of those um, more financially supportive Hathaway programs. So if you want to touch on, and if you know the numbers, you say you have seven freshmen, how many of them are on Hathaway? And I just want to make sure that they're not precluded if they receive Hathaway from getting additional scholarship, just how that works. Um, President Seidel. Chair Ellis, I, I, I don't know the numbers on that, but we will find out perhaps if James does or perhaps Bill, I will let you know. I don't have the numbers. Um, I, I do know that um, the numbers are lower, um, like you mentioned. Um, one of the issues I think that uh, was a problem from what we heard from the, the Wyoming Department of Education um, is the, the lack of a foreign language. Um, that, that was one of the issues, uh, and, and it would be good to revisit that uh, conversation with um, the Wyoming Department of Education to see what we can do to help increase those numbers. Um, I do want to share with you one example of a student who did um, graduated from Wyoming Indian, and she received the Hathaway Scholarship. Uh, she was a freshman um, just when, the, when COVID hit. 
and uh, the students were sent home. She was, um, of course, trying to do her work remotely, um, like all the students were expected to uh, from her home. But they didn't have very good um, reception there. And um, she wasn't able to, uh, the opportunity for her to get online was really spotty. Um, twice, her, uh, her family came and talked to me, but twice, uh, she was in the middle of a test and they lost reception. And so the instructor told her that she had to take whatever it was, however far she was in the, in the, on the test. That was her score. And she just got really discouraged and she, she felt like she was gonna ruin her GPA, um, trying to do it the way that she was. And so she, uh, she ended up dropping out. Um, she hasn't come back yet. And, and you know, that, that's just really discouraging to see uh, that that happened. Um, and so, you know, I'm really glad that President Seidel sees the need um, for Brown Bad and, 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 and also expanding those opportunities so that our students can be sex successful uh, in situations like that. Just to follow up, maybe my charge will be to visit with some of our reservation districts and ask, it's one thing to, um, take the scholarship, it's another to just be eligible. And so I, I will be, it would be curious to know how many of their graduating seniors would be eligible for one of the levels of pathway. And if they don't take it, I get, you know, there are lots of reasons, but I think that might be another indicator if, if we're looking for other metrics in addition to how they perform on SATs or ACTs or whatever mm -hmm. assessment else we use. But um, that's the concern, right? Is we've made this promise to so many Wyoming kids and when we're not gearing up our native students to be able to have access to that. We're not, we're not doing our job and it's a bigger, much bigger issue, obviously. So thank you for that additional or commitment to provide additional information. Further questions from committee members? Senator Case. Um, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I'm kind of curious about students that attend the university after coming, uh, coming after a junior college. So say Central Wyoming College native students that proceed to the university. Have you thought about or looked into the success factors there? And uh, uh, I can, I have an example with my own son, who's not native, of course, but um, he uh, was a CWC student. He did very well at CWC. He hit the university and he was in the business school and he crashed and burned. It was, uh, you know, it, it was pretty big disaster. Um, I happen to be real good friends with Chris Boswell, and uh, I swear we didn't pull anything, but, <laughs> but uh, he was going to be exited from the university, and he deserved it. Um, and Chris said, you know, let me talk to the president about this. There might be a program for him. And uh, so... And I had talked to my son. He was a little late in confessing about all this, but he'd been big man on campus here. And then he gets to the business school and he was, uh, uh, you know, it's a huge school. I tried to talk to the dean a couple of times. It, it was just really unsuccessful. And I'm and imagining that this might be something like what a Native American student might face. Um, so um, the president, President Nichols at that time, uh, she was delightful and she said you know let's let's figure this out and my son ended up not being being uh, he really wanted to be in business but he was focused on agriculture so he went to ag business and ag economics and that program saved him and the the uh the president of the university has had established a kind of a deal for troubled kids that could make good and so he had a weekly meeting with the dean of the ag college just to touch base, just a 10 minute meeting. How you doing, George, and all this. I, I can tell you, Mr. President, that was the most successful thing, probably the best thing that's happened in my family. And uh, his mom and I are so grateful that honestly, he graduated, he got the degree, he's a great kid, he did well, he got good grades. Um, and I can just take that and I've, I expanded with uh, Dr. Nichols at the time and I said, you know, do you really look at the experience of uh, community college kids that come to the university? Because they don't have that automatic bonding as freshmen that, that you kind of get thrown in and you're all together and, and there are programs for that. But 
maybe non-traditional students, maybe entering students from community colleges and maybe especially native students if they enter this way. And I actually suspect they more of them enter this way than as a freshman in that big bunch. Have we continued anything in that way? Are you guys thinking about that? Um, it sure made the difference for my kid. And I'm just wondering if we're focusing on that. And since Dr. Tyndall's here and all, thank you. Mm -hmm. President Seidel. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Ellis and, and Senator Case. Um, that is a, that's, that's a big, big topic um, that we're actually looking at very hard. Uh, so, but let, let me answer the first part of the question, which was, uh, as I remember, um, uh, are we looking at Native American success rates as they transfer in from community colleges? I was actually looking for numbers like that this morning, preparing for this, and I, I, don't, I don't have that number. I did see that uh, transfer students from the community colleges have slightly lower grade point averages on average compared to students who just come straight to the university. So that, that wasn't significant. It was most significant in the College of Business, I would say. <laughs> so that's something that I think we really do need to look at. And so I do, as, as uh, a Representative Larson says, I am a numbers person. I like to really look at this and try to understand what's the, what are the data and then how can we take interventions to address this. And a more broad point, um, a couple of answers. One is I started a program last year where everyone in the cabinet is supposed to be mentoring some students. And so I, I did this last year and uh, I had one student, um, I must say, I, I became quite close to, quite fond of, and she transferred out of the university. And somebody said, well, they're not going to let the president have any more mentor mentors. <laughs> but, but anyway, the point is, I really understood the factors in that particular case much better. And I felt at least I, I was learning something. And, and actually, in, in my defense, the one thing I did was I did introduce her to the president of New Mexico State, where she went to. So she still has a president as a mentor. <laughs> but, but the point is, we're looking at this. The new provost has had had uh, a lot of experience in providing specific programs for first, first year and first generation students coming in, in particular, a boot camp that he is uh, starting up based on what he did at University of Nevada at Reno. And so that will be operating next year, uh, for particularly for first generation students. It had enormous value in increasing success rates and retention rates of first, uh, first generation students. So we're going to be doing that. We've also started a program program last year called Cowboy Coaches that is one that's aimed at uh, having a, a cohort of undergraduate students who have a specific responsibility as a like a paid internship almost to mentor first generation and freshman students in particular. And uh, that was very successful. So we had only a dozen of them last year. We're growing that to uh, several times that, and we hope to have a couple of hundred of them by next year. So th this, there's going to be a sustained program at the university aimed at increasing success rate of first year and first generation students. And then we will look specifically at the factors around community colleges as well. Additional questions, Co-Chairman Larson. So, Madam Chairman, a um, couple of things. In response to the scenario that James brought about, the, the, the individual that couldn't take the test because of our broadband, welcome to Fremont County. Mm -hmm. And it's just not our tribal members. It's, it's we, we our broadband in, in the county is not what we would like it to be. And we can't wave a magic wand and do that. But if we've got students down at the university that are not able to attend in person or are gonna be required to do it remotely, surely we have the ability to reach out to our school district, to the community college and say, we've got these kids in your area that are at home can they come and take their classes in your facility where we have broadband, where we have access so that they don't lose a year or drop out completely? Surely we can, I, I would plead with you to do that because that, oh, what a tragedy that is and, and may never get them back. So right. just that comment, Madam Chairman, and hope that we could reach out because it's not their fault that they can't go right. down there and go to school. It's a decision made. And so we ought to help them to continue to succeed, please. So, uh, President Seidel, um, one of the reasons that my co-chairman and I really have wanted to have you here is we, when they was going through the selection process, this committee sent a letter to the trustees and we says, please, when you pick a new president, do not lose ground in what we've been trying to do with our Native American students. 
just we don't want to go backward. So here you are, and you have a broad, fresh vision, frankly, from what we're accustomed to. You come from a different background, and um, you're driving the bus. Now, you may not feel like you are. <laughs> <laughs> you may not feel like you are I'm being but, driven on buses in different yeah, directions. So, <laughs> but from where we're at, sure. And, and so I'm wanting to know with this vision you have of entrepreneurship and, and computer um, uh, competency, in, in all of this vision that you see in taking the university to a new level and then looking at and so we look at we look at Representative Clipper, we look at Rory Chin, Tindor, we look at Anna Beta, we look at you know these kids that have um, I can still call them kids that left uh, our good councilman, our, our chairman Dresser here that left got an education they want to come home and they want to they want to succeed here um, and so. My question is, is in, in this vision, how do you see the degrees for success? And then when we send them home, what do we have in place to support them? Because coming, and I, I don't care if it's on the reservation or any place else, so as graduates and they re sometimes they get there and they have to, there has to be a change. I didn't learn this computer program. And now the company I worked for saying, I need this. Can, what are my resources? So is there a network that you envision that particularly on the reservation that will allow these graduates to come back home, succeed and continue to succeed? Can you Mm -hmm. Am I making any sense mm -hmm. with that yep. question? President Seidel. Thank you, Senator Ellis. Yes, uh, thanks for the question. Um, so the, the first thing I want to say is um, I am absolutely committed to uh, strengthening our relationships with Native American communities here and to do what we can to advance uh, the workforce and uh, economic development specifically around Native American communities. And so I, I think I, those of you who know me, you will have heard me talk about this. And I, I mean it from my heart and I mean it programmatically as well. Um, when I talk about the idea of entrepreneurship, I'm not thinking about people trying to create the next Google, although that would be nice, but I'm really talking about making sure that we provide the tools and the mentoring networks as well. That's a very important aspect of this to make sure that students learn how to take their own destiny uh, into their hands and then have opportunities when they graduate. So one of the problems we have at the university, and it's not, a, it's one, it's worse in Wyoming than in, in a lot of states, but um, uh, it's, it's not the worst, is that 70% of our students leave, our graduates leave the state. And so we wanna make sure that we provide opportunities for students uh, to stay in the state. And so we, we've talked a lot about growing corporate partnerships as one aspect of that. So as, as we work with companies, our students are trained in what companies expect. The companies learn what our students are capable of, and they're really capable of a lot. Our students in particular, because of the, you know, the, the, the word grit is used a lot in Wyoming, but it's a sense of, you know, tenaciousness and so on. I, I really believe that's, that's true. So that, that they will understand why they need to provide opportunities in the state. And then secondly, the entrepreneurship uh, challenges that we have. So we want to grow the companies that from that are homegrown, they're much more likely to stick to the state. And we then we have to provide the opportunities for that to happen. So th those are like general points. Now, specifically on the Native American issues, um, that's why I want to spend a lot of time getting to understand the specific factors around uh, Native American culture that impact. So we, if we train someone in a particular way, uh, maybe it works for students from, you know, Laramie High School, but it doesn't necessarily work for people from Wind River because we have to understand the local factors. That's why I've, I've had uh, conversations with President Tyndall in particular and with, with James and with the, the, uh, the business councils. I wanna spend a day just really talking through if we were to develop specific programs to help grow the economic opportunities for uh, the, the Wind River 
uh, region, what would what do they look like? What is customized that makes sense here? So for example, digital skills are transportable anywhere, but what do we need to know? If there's not broadband, we have to get uh, broadband to the Frank Wise building or wherever it is, you know, we'll work specifically on that. So I just need to understand, I think we collectively need to understand not to come in and say, well, we're gonna offer these, these five programs, but hopefully that's not going, but <laughs> we, we offer these five programs. We wanna hear what five programs do you need? What do they need to look like? And so we're dedicated to that. Thank you. Additional questions, I see uh, Chairman Dresser, welcome. Did you have a comment you'd like to make? Yes, thank you for opening up the um, public comment, um, Madam Chairwoman. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank all the individuals who spoke. Um, President Tyndall, you know, it's always a pleasure. You know, President Tyndall has taken ample time to meet with the Northern Rapid Business Council to discuss various decisions and, and comments about different things. Um, I have yet to meet you yet. You know, I am the chairman of the Northern Rapid Tribe. I'm also alumni of the University of Wyoming. Um, but going back to the different things of what we can kind of do to attract and retain different native students is I think you need to really utilize the local community in that aspect, you know, and I think in the past, the university had constantly kind of gone to different, the same individuals, while in the past, you kind of got to widen the net. I, I spoke at um, University of Montana and Bozeman recently, you know, they asked me to speak out there. I have a film coming out next, next month, and I was a guest speaker up there. And they hit a record high for native students there, close to 800. And it's led actually by an East Shoshone tribal member named Lisa Perry. So she did a very key thing. You go down south and um, this past summer, um, we were in Colorado because Colorado did a pretty big thing. They offered in-state tuition to all tribes who, um, who have ancestral tribes to Colorado. So right there, it was kind of opening up. So I hate to say it, but I think that a lot of Native students are thinking of the different places outside of there because it's attracting that money aspect, which is a key thing. I'm also a member of the Northern Rapala Endowment um, Committee. And I think that speaks about, and I could also slightly speak about the different people who have um, had different issues in the students, but it's, 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 the, it's the aspect of like learning how to communicate and not that, because nobody's ever asked me about that, you know, and my thoughts about the endowment. And I've been on there for 10 years now, you know, uh, I'm outgoing and I will be selecting the person who will be incoming, you know, but that's just the key thing. It's about those key conversations, you know, once again, I'm grateful for these different conversations we could have, but it's just being able to have them in a meaningful way. But it also, we got to start looking outside of what's going on. My I mean, Montana's doing something right, you know, Colorado's very much doing something right, you know, and I just think those are key things that we can have. And, you know, to kind of go back to the, to the housekeeping thing, I think it is important that we kind of, um, as tribal nations, we kind of can see the agenda a little bit before and also be able maybe to amend it to add individuals because, you know, both tribes have higher education um, programs. So it would have been good if we had Harmony Spoon and through there and also um, the Northern Apple Tribe one as well, so that they can give that input with that. And also us as tribal nations that we could have a, a say with that aspect. You know, I think that's just a very good housekeeping comment to make with this. And with that, I would like to meet you. You know, I have to go. This has been a great few days, but those are just my closing comments with that, is that we just need a better way to kind of communicate and also be able to meet in a way where both tribes feel like they're heard in various ways. And not only with this issue, but across the board. So I thank you all, you all have a good day. Thank you. Questions for Jordan Dresser. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Uh, President Seidel, did you want to make some comments? Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair Ellison. And I really appreciate those comments, actually. In, in fact, two weeks ago, I visited the campus at, at in Bozeman at Montana State, and we asked about that, and we heard, and I felt quite jealous <laughs> about how well they were doing. Uh, and so I, I'll only say that uh, I am committed to, to coming and hearing what I need to hear and listening and taking it in and responding as best we can to address the issues we hear. Thank you, Mr. Trosper. And just to let you know, ma'am, I know you're up here. We're going to, um, when this panel closes, we'll open this up for public comment just on this discussion. So we will get to you, I promise. Thanks. I just I want to say uh, real quick that um, I appreciate um, uh, Chairman jo uh, Jordan Dresser's um, contributions to this conversation. I think that uh, it would be good to remind the uh, 
the Select Committee on Tribal Relations that the chairman, um, Chairman Brown, uh, that was two terms ago, I guess now, um, had made a proposal to the Board of Trustees, um, went down and met with the, the trustees. And uh, because of the uh, Northern Arapaho Tribes uh, 1851 treaty, that uh, not only was that land uh, traditional Arapaho land, but it was actually legally theirs through that 1851 treaty. And that encompasses that whole Southeast corner of Wyoming, um, a big chunk of Colorado, uh, Kansas and Nebraska. And uh, based on that, um, as was mentioned, like he mentioned, uh, the Colorado is giving all the tribes associated with Colorado in-state tuition. The uh, business council had asked that if there could be some type of tuition waiver um, if it couldn't be a full, um, if they weren't willing to uh, give a waiver for the full amount, even just working something out with the Arapaho uh, Business Council. And really the whole objective was so that their Northern Arapaho Endowment could go further, could help more students um, and be used in, in other uh, ways. Um, there never really was an answer um, back from the Board of Trustees. It just I, you know, maybe that's something that the business council should follow up with. Um, and, and so I just wanted to remind the legislature, uh, let the select committee on tribal relations that 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 was done before. Um, I, I also think that it's really important that we remember that the University of Wyoming is really central to a lot of different tribes, um, South Dakota, Montana, um, Southern uh, uh, Colorado, uh, there's there's reservations that are all within close distance. The other thing that we should we should consider and think about is that Denver is only uh, two hours away from Laramie, and that area, according to their statistics, there's fifty thousand Native American people that live within the Denver area, and so that that's a huge recruitment um, area. And so there should be no reason that we couldn't have those same numbers that Bozeman and some of the other places have if we do things right. Thank you for those additional comments. Any other questions from committee members? Seeing none, thank you for being with us and thank you for making the time to get up here for our meeting. We appreciate it. Thanks and, for the chance to come up here. You know, we'll appreciate certainly it. look forward to the follow-up information. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Alrighty, is there, um, just wanna get a show of hands from the audience. Who wants to talk on the topic of the University of Wyoming or community colleges specifically? Okay, we've got one person, does anyone else? Two? Okay, we have two individuals, three? Okay, we've got three individuals who'd like to um, present. So please come to the microphone, make sure that the green light is on before you're gonna testify. And uh, we welcome your testimony. Thank you. Madam Chair, this is, um, my name is Andrea Abeda. And um, I would like to add to what Jordan Dresser said about Bozeman, Montana State University. I'm currently a PhD student there. And I can definitely say the support that I get is tremendous. Um, the personal phone calls I would get from Lisa um, Perry were regular. Um, my professors um, definitely had a close tie with me uh, throughout my second master's degree and also working now on my PhD. I'm very grateful for everything that they do there. So I wanna definitely just um, add to what Jordan said. Um, I also wanna say as an educator and enrolled member of the Eastern Shoshone tribe, and as um, a board member of the Chief Washakie Foundation, I have noticed um, just looking at all of the applicants, um, it's really, um, promising to me to see the growth and to see all of those that we're able to give scholarships to. It's not just to Shoshone members, it, and it's not even just to Native American members, it's to anybody that has ties with the reservation. And so, um, for example, we gave a scholarship to a teacher that was working at Wyoming Indian, and he was so grateful. But we look at those applications and we see what is it that they're gonna do for our native people when they get their degree at the University of Wyoming and it's not tied to specific 
um, majors or anything. And so I'm really um, honored to be a part of that board and to see all of the applicants that come through and to see all of those students that really do, do need the help. And um, I can say that many times um, we've awarded every single applicant and it's been um, awesome that we've been able to do that. It's a blessing for them because I know that just that little, like $500 might seem like a lot of money to um, a student that might need it at that time when um, for the foundation, we're just blessed to be able to award that to some of those students. So I see uh, the major need for those endowments. I'm also really grateful to the new president because after we did the Zedora Excellence Fund um, Award Ceremony, he sat down and he talked to us about all these things that we can do. And as uh, the curriculum coordinator, right now I'm on sabbatical leave, but at that time, I, I just saw so many connections that we could do with our students. And one is, I see, uh, and please forgive me, um, you know, in maybe not speaking so highly about what's happening at Fort Washkey, uh, Fremont County School District 21, but um, just from personal experience being the curriculum coordinator and trying to get our admin to understand and realize we need to start down way in the lower grades. We need to start clear down in pre-K all the way up talking about um, different, um, what they wanna do for their career, um, going out and getting those mentors and being, um, uh, micro credentialing and everything that they're trying to do throughout the state to see how can we it's not just a reservation and a native problem it's like throughout the state a lot of our smart top students will take a job in Denver or somewhere else where it's higher paying or it's more um, it just looks more I guess glamorous to them you know and so um, I just want to say that I really think we need to start way way down and start giving those field trips to our little kids maybe even in sixth grade, my brother used to do that and he's not allowed to do it anymore, but they would go and they would see what the university was like. They would spend a day down there and just look at, you know, watch a football game and stay in the dorms or, or do take a tour. And I think we need more of that for our native students and, um, and even just more recruiting for upward bound and different things like that. But I think um, not waiting till they're a junior in high school, talking to them about their applications, but we really need to start way down um, low, like in sixth grade, so that they can be prepared in high school to look at their GPA and then be ready for those scholarships. So I um, just wanted to say that I, I'm just so grateful um, for this time. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Abeda? Seeing none, um, I would ask you, um, start paying attention to what's happening in our Joint Education Committee. We're trying to really drill down on some you know, early literacy issues, absenteeism, all those things that are trying to tackle um, some of our at-risk students and um, native students in particular. So we're, we're doing, we're trying, but it's, it's, it's work and, and work in progress. Mr. Co-Chair. Thank you, Andrea Dolores Abeda. Um, but Andrea brings to the point that we need to start earlier in, in getting people used to the University of Wyoming. And we, we look here, but it's not just here. We had a meeting with the, the past president because on the western side of the state, all our, all our Wyoming kids go to Rexburg or Logan and, you know, and we've got, we've got to get them down there. And so I think you're spot on. We've got to, we've got to get them familiar and, and have little cowboy t-shirts on all of those guys to where they stand their ground. So I, I just completely agree with you. And it's not just here, it's, it's, it's statewide. Thank you so much. And we'll go to Mr. Harris next. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, I really hadn't intended to speak, but I, I have two things that I'd like to uh, expound on. Uh, I'm the co-chair of the Chief Washakie Foundation. Uh, in addition to the numbers James gave you, I will tell you that we have awarded over $350,000 in scholarships. All that's been possible because of two things. First, when we established the Chief Washakie Memorial Endowment and Senator Case is on our committee and was then, we had some spirited and long debates about where that would be established. It was established at UW for one reason. The state had a match program. For every dollar we gave, we got a dollar. And instead of having 
a $250,000 scholarship, we had nearly a half million dollar scholarship. That wasn't an expense, that was an investment. I can tell you our scholars have come back to this community. They're leaders of our tribal business councils. They're leaders in our schools. They're leaders on our school boards. We have changed the future and that can happen again, but only if the legislature is willing to look at return on investment and not cost. And I know this isn't that committee, but you all sit on other committees. And I hope as you debate the budget, and I've been there, uh, I hope that that will stay foremost in your mind, whether it's uh, for our Native American students or any other student, that is an investment in the future of this state. Uh, the other thing, and this is purely anecdotal, I believe it was Senator Case asked about the success ratio. I also worked for about 15 years with the uh, college access programs here at CWC, Upward Bound, Gear Up, uh, Educational Talent Search. I can tell you from the students that I had that I followed, the students, Native American or non-Native, who participated in our program, started at CWC and then went to UW were far more successful and completed uh, their four-year degree to a much higher level. And I won't even pretend to give you an exact percentage, but I know that those students versus the students that went straight from our high schools to UW had a high, high success ratio. And that's another thing that, uh, you know, the university and the community colleges are working much better on that. And that's the other thing that, that has made the success of the Chief Washiki Endowment Scholarships really work is the cooperation that we've gotten over the years from UW. It's really made a difference and uh, has really been appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Harris? Good advice from a former legislator. Thank you so much. Superintendent Shakespeare, welcome. Thank you, Chairwoman Ellis. And before I start, Leslie Shakespeare for the record. Before I start, uh, for my initial comments, I wanna just make a quick comment as a former alum of, or not former, an alum of University of Wyoming. As you know, our time, our educational paths were crossed at the University of Wyoming as was Representative Clifford. And we've gone through several different administrators, people who are presidents, always stating the same commitment to Native Americans, reaching out to business councils. We have plans that come and go with those people. And it always seems like we're back at the same spot saying we have another commitment to the reservation, to the tribal members, to those youth that are coming up. And it always seems like we take a step forward and two steps back. So I just want to make that comment for uh, President Seidel since he was here and he's new to the, I know I had a brief conversation with him before he started, but uh, I think that's important to have on the record for people who have been there and have seen this over the years. Um, but to, to the comments I wanted to make is more on the, on the line of uh, Representative Larson when you're talking about uh, careers of coming back to the reservation. Uh, I didn't want to miss this opportunity of having both President um, Tyndall as well as President Seidel here at, at, for the colleges and university is that the Department of Interior has a pathways program um, that has paid internships for college students. You just need to be at least 18 years old, be an enrolled member of a re federally recognized tribe, maintain a security clearance and sign and maintain a participant agreement, maintain good academic standing and um, at the end of your, when you graduate, you're just about guaranteed a position with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And some of the areas that we do have is like in biological sciences, our forestry, wildland fire, agriculture and rangeland, engineering and architectural, physical science, legal and business, as well as social work as well. Um, so there's a, a lot of opportunities there that I think is missed just because there's this long standing um, angst against government work, particularly BIA, when it comes from tribal members. You know, everybody thinks, you know, for the longest time, the BIA was 
essentially the tip of the spear for the federal government and all the past policies that were really negative towards Native Americans. I think now, as you can see, um, a shift in that thinking. Our new Secretary of Interior has really want to recruit tribal members to come into the uh, careers within the Bureau of Indian Affairs. It reminds me of a conversation I recently had for the Indian Re Relay podcast here with CWC with one of the students. I got to uh, record just a couple of weeks ago with a new set of students. And one of the questions that was asked to me is, how does it feel being you know, superintendent of Wind River Agency? You know, I'm the first tribal member in this position. I'm the youngest one ever to hold this position. And I didn't really answer you know, how I felt. I um, answered in a way that I said, representation matters. I know as you as elected officials, when you, Senator Ellis, when you first got elected, I was really excited for that, having the first female Native American on the Senate side. Then when you got elected, Representative Clifford for being from Wind River, I thought that was exciting. But that representation should also translate into the institutions that impact people's day-to-day -day lives. And one of the institutions that clearly affects the day-to-day -day lives particularly here on the Wind River Reservation is the BIA. I mean, every, you, we talk about issues with broadband, with range, with everything, all the topics that were covered here that intersect with BIA in some form or fashion. And right now we're really at a crossroads with, with, with the agency, with a lot of federal agencies for that matter. We have a lot of tenured career service individuals who have, you know, just this past year, I gave uh, service awards for 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, 35 years, and they're all set to retire. And within my agency, we have two who have under five years of service. So we don't, and we have maybe three in that five to 20 year range. So we're gonna have a lot of open positions. And when you have a lot of open positions, you have a lot of the issues of, um, addressing tribal needs go unmet, or there's a strong, a long delay. So I just wanted to say, look, if you want to make a difference in your tribal way, um, things that are happening, be reflective of that in the agencies that are servicing you on a day-to-day -day basis. And one way is to do that is through this Pathways program. I know I've been successful in hiring at least one individual out of college. This past summer, we had three interns none of them from Wyoming, none of them from Wind River. Uh, one was from South Dakota, one was from Michigan, one was from Montana. And they all love it here. They all wanna come back and they are all in different fields from natural resources to our wildland fire to our um, the realty section. So I just wanna make this opportunity very aware and I really encourage the presidents of the university and CWC to make this a priority for your Travel students, you know, it's a paid job in the summertime. Um, there's an opportunity for their tuition to be paid. And then they have a guaranteed career, entry level career once they graduate. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Questions for Superintendent Shakespeare. Thank you. Mr. Co Chair. Madam Chairman, I think that members of the committee would, would agree, and uh, Superintendent Shakespeare. Um, going back to when you were on the, on the tribal council, uh, you identified that this this meeting really was a three legged stool. There was the state, there was the tribes, and the and the bureau. And, and really, thanks a lot in part to your effort, we've been able to from that point on have Bureau of Indian Affairs in these committee meetings. And so, great step forward, and, and appreciate your effort in helping to get that that done because it really it, it really everything that takes place here it seems like the bureau has some impact and to get them in on that has really been we've been able to do some good things so thank you all righty thank you so much um public comment on education is closed um we're in the final stages of wrapping up our meeting i would like a show of hands how many people would like to testify and just provide general comment after these last two days. We have one individual, of course, Chairman Sinclair, welcome. And Scott. and Scott Ratliff, and then Senator Case. Madam Chairman, members of the committee, 
Thank you very much for hearing me today. Uh, I wanna preface my remarks by saying that I do have respect for the committee and its members. <clears throat> you may or may not agree with what I have to say to here today, but hopefully you'll listen. I have participated in this committee for over a year. I finally realized what the committee is about. The subject matter for the agenda is entirely controlled by the committee. There's no input requested from the tribes. Presenters are not contacted in advance to inquire if they want to participate as a pre presenter or what they want to present. Tribal employees are contacted directly, not contacted, but set on the agenda for matters that uh, their supervisors or the tribes may or may not want to reveal. The agenda is not limited to legislation. For example, there's the administration of the water, the water rights that was on the agenda and was on previously. We have a procedure for this in our tribal government. Yet this committee is, allow, is allowed or is allowing itself to circumvent our government by discussing these matters and, and making us answer as to why we administer the water one way or the other. Water users should exhaust their remedies. Go to the water board if you don't like the way your water rights are being exercised on the reservation. The next step is to go to the tribal council. And after that, you can go into the tribal court. Those are the remedies that are available not to come to this committee. Now, tribal governments, <clears throat> the actions of the committee display a disrespect for our governments. And also, in my opinion, an attempt to undermine it. Tribal governments have existed even before the existence of the federal government, which states are subordinate to. If true, true history were taught in our schools, we would all know that the United States Constitution was patterned after the Iroquois Confederacy. For this committee to adopt an attitude of superiority toward our government and people ignores history and reality. In closing, I heard two things yesterday I agree with. The first one, that the tribe should go ahead and, and look at legislation on its own I agree with that. I agree we should go through our liaison and our representative, Representative Clifford. Secondly, what I've heard and agree with is that this is the committee's last meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Chairman Sinclair? Uh, Chairman Sinclair, I would just apologize. And, um, you know, we've got my commitment. I'll reach out with my co-chairman. We'll reach out to you and um, try and figure out a better path forward. You know, certainly this committee has been in existence. You heard some discussion about that today for a number of years, and it's been doing things the way it's been doing things. And so when you inherit the gavel, you there's a, our process, and this is kind of how it works from the legislative end, um, you know, for chairman to set agenda items. And so certainly, um, you know, we want to make sure that we're treating both tribes with the due process they're afforded and happy to visit with you about how we can um, alter that process. Uh, after our meeting yesterday, one thing that uh, we discussed with the LSO was making sure that you are provided with hard copies of our committee meeting materials in advance. Um, I think we can come up with lots of ideas to hopefully address some of the concerns that you have um, and certainly extend my apologies. That's certainly not our intent. Um, I think I can speak for everyone on this committee that we try hard and we work hard and we're, we're doing our best, but can we do it better? Absolutely. Always can do something better. So we'll, we'll reach out to you. And if it means driving up here to have that conversation with you one-on-one, -on -one, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to do that and happy to discuss some options so you, that, that, so we alleviate that concern. 
Thank you. Any other comments? Thank you. Okay, with that, um, public comment is closed. Oh, um, Madam. Oh, sorry, Mr. Or I Senator thought there Case. were others that wanted to make public comments. Senator Case. And I do. It was there, I thought there were three. There was other general public Oh, Scotty, comment. I am so sorry. Mr. Ratliff, my apologies. Thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the committee. Um, I'm not here. Hello? Okay. Um, I, I just want to uh, share a thought. Um, we had the dedication of the Veterans Memorial on August 14th. And I thought it was uh, one of the the most uh, wonderful moments of my life. And I have spoke with, with members of, of both councils about a desire I have to at some point have that August 14th dedicated as a day of recognition for Native Americans, veteran, veterans that are Native Americans. Um, I'm, I'm in the process of working on that happening. Um, there's been some discussion about ways to do it. My, my preference would be that both councils would pass a resolution supporting that. If, if that doesn't happen, then this won't happen. I mean, that's kind of where I'm at with it. Then I'd like to see the state of Wyoming make that recognition happen. And then <clears throat> I would like to see it become a national day of recognition. So um, obviously the 14th is somewhat uh, arbitrary, but the that's the day we had the dedication and uh, and it was a great day, so. That's what I'm proposing. Actually, I'm just sharing my plan. I'm not, I'm not asking for your, your support at this time. Questions for Mr. Ratliff, Representative Clifford. Madam Chairwoman, to my knowledge, we already sell honor, honor Native American Veterans Day on November 10th before the national regular Veterans Day. We do as a tribe, I can speak for specifically the Northern Arapaho tribe and both joint councils, the tribal, because I worked in HR. So we already do that on November 10th, specifically for Native American veterans. I wasn't aware of that, Madam Chair. Oh, very good. Okay, um, thank you, um, uh, Madam Chairman and Representative Clifford. Um, I, I was not aware of the 10th. Um, I will pursue it differently. Thank you. Okay, Senator Case. I thought you had one more, but I'm not sure. Okay. So um, thank you very, very much. I'm, um, I'm sorry about some of the undertow tones that we're leaving this committee with. I, I think this is an extremely good committee and a good process. And it's, it's a unique process among uh, the states and tribe relations. Um, it takes different forms. I, I was on the original committee. I've, this is the 21st year of this committee. I'm still on it. Um, and I served as chairman of this committee for 11 years from 2007 to 2018. Um, every chairperson does things differently. Uh, and uh, how the agenda gets developed and things. Um, I tend to concur with uh, my good friend, the chairman of the Shoshone tribe, that 
uh, we could be more collaborative in developing our agenda and we could uh, take a little bit of time to listen to people more. But I think this committee is doing a good job and uh, not everybody sees it but from the beginning, like I seen it, you know, and not everybody's has seen the ups and downs. So we've had staff that have jumped in and the new staff and or staff that are coming into their own. And it's been a lot of changes, a lot of changes on the committee in 21 years. So I think it's normal that we just rededicate ourselves to reaching out and the ideals of the committee and working with our, our, our friends and our constituents and our uh, and the beloved people that share this land with. And so um, I appreciate that from Chairman St. Clair. It's frank, it's something we can work with. Um, I also, I wanna have three minutes to tell you that um, about the Sinks Canyon issue. And I think that the master plan developed by state parks has not included tribal consultation in any way that, that section 106, the spirit and the specific requirements require. And um, I know that this is of a concern that, that ancient people were uh, used, people of all tribes use this region. And in fact, the original Shoshone reservation included all the way to the continental divide. And so I hope this committee and, and the folks, uh, my co-chairman have uh, kind of been involved in this, one through a different committee and one through participation in the master plan. I ask you to respect this tribal consultation process and think about it some more. I'm not saying you don't respect it, please. I'm not criticizing you. I feel like it's been a taboo subject and it affects how our government interacts with our tribal friends about something that's very personal, important to people. With that, I commend you for your service and your, your good leadership. Um, I think it's been a hard year for everybody. <laughs> Everybody's a little alley. Um, and I look forward to better times ahead and you have my commitment. Thank you. Thank you. With that, Mr. Chairman, we've um, hit the end of our meeting. Heather, did you wanna run through again? Um, a list of to do's from the day just to make sure we are all on the same page and haven't missed anything. Madam Chairwoman, I'm picking up with just today's to do list. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, I have a note to get from President Tyndall the Why Wear Orange documentary, I think, to, to send to the committee. There is, um, you requested a 10 year look back period from. Um, President Seidel with, with including um, pre and post opening of the cultural center comparison of other demographics and things um, like that from President Seidel. Uh, Mr. Trosper is going to uh, get to me, I believe the five-year strategic plan from the cultural center. Um, I have a note that Representative Clifford referred to a study of 10 Northern Arapaho women who succeed and why um, that was a note I think to obtain that, but then maybe perhaps for uh, the, the committee to give that to President Seidel. And then um, also the, it was requested to get from the university, the numbers from the university regarding the Hathaway Scholarship, graduating seniors who would be eligible and so forth. And those were, uh, and the committee elected to sponsor uh, two bills when there were some uh, uh, um, amendments to those. Okay, that sounds accurate. Alrighty, committee members, that um, sums up our work for the interim. Thank you, everyone, for showing up, being here, being prepared. Um, appreciate it. And we'll see you again in 2022.